Good morning, everyone. I would like to welcome all of you um, to the Southern California HIV and Aging Conference. My name is Jeff Bailey. I'm the Director of HIV Access here at APLA Health. And we are looking forward to two full days of very interesting, exciting presentations from some subject matter, subject matter experts across not just California, but the United States as well. I think we all recognize that participating in a virtual conference such as this is not like being face to face, but I'm confident that our subject matter experts will be very engaging and informative. So stay tuned to your monitor throughout the next uh, five hours for today. Just to let you know, uh, the purpose of this conference is to present information that can help each of the health jurisdictions represented here today examine their current HIV service delivery system and identify strategies to realign their portfolio of services to meet the needs of older adults living with HIV. Recognizing 30 years of the Ryan White program, significant changes have transpired with the legislation, transitioning from an emergency response to one that focuses on more core medical services. Now that people are living longer, the HIV service delivery system requires another transformation to address the specific needs of an aging population. The programs for older adults are not new, and it's evident going back to the formation of this country and structured within the federal government with the passage of the Social Security Act in 1935 and the Older Americans Act passed in 1965. Numerous evidence-based strategies are already present within the aging services system, and we'll be hearing from an expert panel represent that, representing that field on Friday. The HIV service delivery system can learn a great deal from this field. Next Friday on September 29th, we'll be hosting a smaller cohort of participants, many of you who will be represented from this conference to brainstorm ideas specific to each health jurisdiction to inform the realignment of services in the Ryan White system. More information will be shared about these sessions during the next two days of this conference if you're interested in participating. But before I proceed with today's presentation, I just would like to thank the team from APLA, the Pacific AIDS Education Center from the Los Angeles area, and the Center for Identification um, Prevention and Treatment Services who coordinated this conference. I'd also like to thank our Zoom expert, Victoria Myers, who has been very helpful and instrumental in uh, coordinating the technological aspect of this conference and acknowledge Gilead Sciences and Janssen Pharmaceuticals for their funding support. So with that said, I think we are ready to get started. And please welcome Brian Risley and Tom Donahoe. These are your lovely hosts for both today and Friday. Thank you all so much and enjoy the conference. Thank you. Good, thank you, Jeff. Um, just, just to reiterate that third day session is uh, Tuesday, the 29th oh, of I'm sorry. September. Um, so, so welcome everyone um, and thank you for your participation. At this time, um, um, we want to welcome you to the APLA Health and Pacific AIDS Education Training Center, um, HIV and Aging Southern California Conference. Um, I am Brian Risley uh, with APLA Health. I manage our treatment education in HIV and older adults program. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to my co-moderator. Hi, everybody. Good morning. I'm your co-moderator for today, Tom Donahoe. I'm a professor of family medicine at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA, and I direct the Pacific AIDS Education and Training Center Los Angeles area site. And we'll be using Zoom today. Great, great. Zoom um, webinar. For an optimal conference experience, uh, participants are muted with cameras off. Um, and uh, we do have a scheduled break in today's shorter program. Uh, today we'll go to 1.45 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, for more Zoom tips, I'm gonna turn it back to Tom. Okay, so I'm gonna take us through some housekeeping slides and some audience polling and other information. You may wanna have a pen handy. You probably have one already, but handy for writing down an email or two, um, or if you prefer to do a screenshot, however you might wanna um, capture an email or two. So first I have to read the disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed in this webinar are not necessarily those of the Pacific Aids Education and Training Centers, the Regents of the University of California, or at San Francisco campus. UCSF collectively 
the university, nor of our funder, the Human Resources and Services Administration, HRSA. Neither PATC, university, HRSA, nor any of their officers, board members, agents, employees, students, or volunteers make any warranty, express or implied, including the warranties of merchantability and fitness for a particular purpose, nor assume any legal liability or responsibility for the accuracy, completeness, or usefulness of information, apparatus, or product, or process assessed or described, nor represent that its use would not infringe on privately owned rights. So I direct the Age Education and Training Center for the Los Angeles area, which I'm going to use my cursor here. You can see is right here. So that includes Los Angeles County, Santa Barbara, Ventura, Kern County, and Inyo County. Um, but wherever you live in the United States, you have an AIDS education and training center that serves you. So if you're in Riverside, San Bernardino, or Orange County, you're served by the UCI um, AIDS education and training center. We're all based at schools of medicine. And if you're in San Diego or Imperial counties, you're served by um, UCSD AIDS education and training center. So if you have any doubts wherever you are in the country, you can just Google your state or your city and uh, AIDS education and training center. So as Brian said, some more Zoom housekeeping. Um, we wanna thank Mark McGrath for monitoring uh, your questions today. So do put that in the questions and answers box. Uh, we may be responding to some of your questions in writing um, and we will try to get as many of your questions as possible um, uh, for the, the presenters at the end of each presentation. Uh, use the chat box for uh, sending messages or in some of the audience polling, we'll ask you to put an, an answer under other in the chat box or if you're having technical difficulties, uh, go ahead and put it in the chat box. Uh, we wanna thank Jeff Bailey from APLA for moderating that. And so there's two online evaluations. Today, today's continuing education event is free, but the price of uh, entrance is evaluation. We take evaluation really seriously. So you'll be doing two. The first is our Pacific AIDS Education and Training Center evaluation. And the second is a SurveyMonkey evaluation. And you'll be receiving those after today's webinar. And those are important too for generating your um, CE and participation certificates. Um, so remember this is a two day event. So at the end of the two days, you'll receive an email about um, evaluations. But if you need continuing education for your license, whether mental health or nursing, uh, do send an email to Sandra Cuevas. That's uh, smcuevas at mednet.ucla.edu. Um, and she'll explain how to get your continuing education units for your license. If you just want a certificate of completion, you can get that through the PATC website where you logged in. Oh, and one more note on uh, certificates. Uh, Zoom does send us a listing of each participant and how long they were on the webinar. So if you want full hours, make sure you stay on the webinar for the entire time. So let's go through just very briefly the agenda for today, day one. We've already heard from Jeff Bailey and soon we'll be doing our participant polling. Then we're gonna hear from Dr. Peters on HIV and aging, um, a snapshot of Southern California adults, that's the epi profile. Then we're gonna hear from Dr. Karpiak, surviving another pandemic, HIV and the aging adult population. We're going to have Q and A after both uh, those presentations, we'll have a break. Um, when you come back from the break, we're gonna have a moderated panel uh, called Southern California Sessions Listening Sessions Panel. Day two, which is Friday, we're gonna start off with Brian Risley giving us a recap of day one. Uh, we're gonna go through uh, the same polling questions we did for the first day to see if anything changed. Then we're gonna have a presentation on aging with HIV challenges for a new aging population. Um, then we're gonna have a break. We'll have Q and A after each session. Then we're gonna have um, a moderated panel, uh, tra traditional senior services overview. And then our last presentation for day two is gonna be very timely, HIV, aging, loneliness, and COVID-19. And that'll be um, presented by two mental health providers. And as everyone has mentioned, we have these important regional service delivery sessions. You might wanna write down the time for your county. This is Tuesday, September 29th. So each one is gonna start with a HRSA overview for the county or counties that will be part of the regional listening session. So you can see San Diego and Orange counties are gonna be facilitated by Dr. Karras uh, from UC San Diego. And that'll be from 10.15 to 11.30 on Tuesday. We really need uh, as much participation as we can get, especially from the non-Los Angeles County. So if you're in San Diego or Orange County, uh, we really would like to encourage you to participate. 
Again, that's 1015 to 1130. And then you can see at the red at the bottom of this, if you're interested, please send an email to Brian Risley, that's B-R-I-S-L-E-Y at APLA.org. Uh, if you're in Los Angeles County, we uh, welcome your participation. Again, send a email to Brian, and that's gonna be from uh, 12 to 115. And then finally, again, San Bernardino and Riverside counties, which includes Riverside County includes Palm Springs, where I know there's probably a lot of people can use and want to present the uh, information for the regional service delivery session three, that's gonna be on Tuesday from 1.45 to 3 p.m. So please do email Brian Risley if you'd like to participate in those and we'll be giving you more information throughout today about participating in those um, sessions. So we're gonna go ahead and do some polling questions to see, uh, learn more about you and more about your opinions and what information you have about um, today's topic. So the first thing is where are you? So in which county do you work? Is it Los Angeles, San Diego, Orange, Riverside, San Bernardino, another county, not one of those, uh, in California or are you outside of California? So uh, we just have our first polling question up and go ahead, we'll, we'll give people about 15 seconds to vote. Okay, so I think that's enough time. So Sandra, you wanna pull up the results? And Victoria, if you can remember to do a screenshot of the results. So as expected, the uh, majority of people are coming from Los Angeles County, but we've got a nice mix of people coming from the other counties, but 7% from San Diego, 7% from Orange, um, just 2% from Riverside. So I'd like to encourage our participants from Riverside and actually from, from all of the non-Los Angeles counties. If you've got a friend or colleague uh, that would be interested in participating even today or especially tomorrow, we can give partial credit and especially for the Tuesday listening sessions. And we've got 5% from San Bernardino County. We've got a 13% from outside California. I saw participants from um, throughout the state of California and a couple people that are from outside of California entirely. So welcome to all. And let's pull up the second polling question. So what is your primary work role? Administrator, primary care provider, so physician, physician assistant, nurse practitioner, nurse, dentist, et cetera, um, a mental health provider, a case manager. You have some sort of education role, faculty role, including if you're a peer educator, um, you're a researcher, or you're something else. And if you're gonna click something else, go ahead and write it in the chat. So we know um, when we do summary notes that we've captured all the different people that attended today. So I'm gonna ask Sandra to go ahead and pull those up. So great, we've got about um, one out of five people uh, was um, an administrator. Oh, actually, I realized that I've, now you can see the results. Um, one out of five people is the administrator, um, about almost 10% are primary care providers, 13% mental health, 27% case management, that's fantastic. 4% faculty educator, 8% researcher, and then um, almost one out of five is other. So go ahead and write your role in the chat box. And so our next question is very timely. What do you feel is the biggest COVID-19 related challenge for people with HIV over 50? Uh, what is the biggest challenge they face in your county right now? Is it economic challenges like lost hours or business or um, lost job? Is it a mental health challenge like isolation, loneliness, depression? Is it a medical challenge like they're dealing with their own infection or they're dealing with missing appointments because of COVID? Is it some other uh, challenge like substance use disorders or housing or something not mentioned above? Or is it another challenge that's not listed in any of the challenges above? And if you do click other challenge, go ahead and write in the chat box. We'll give people a couple more seconds for that. Okay, great. So uh, number one is mental health challenges like isolation, loneliness, depression. Uh, number two is economic challenges. The third uh, is medical challenges. Three are other challenges like substance use disorder or housing. And then only 1% said something that wasn't listed above. So go ahead and write that in the chat feature. 
So this is in general. What do you feel is the biggest challenge your county or your agency faces when serving people with HIV over 50? Is it a lack of HIV prevention focus or a lack of HIV prevention services for people over 50? Is it a lack of HIV retention and care focus or services for people over 50? Is it a lack of substance use disorder focus or services for people over 50? Is it a lack of housing focus for people over 50? Or is it some other lack of focus or lack of service for people over 50? So go ahead and give us your answer. Okay, so let's see, lack of housing was uh, almost half the people, 48%. Second, which uh, is lack of HIV prevention focus for people over 50. 14% said lack of retention in care. 11% said lack of substance use disorder focus. And then we have almost one out of 10 people, 9% said some other answer. So go ahead and please write that in the chat box so we can put that in our notes. I feel I can explain the needs of people with HIV over 50 in my county. So this is a Likert scale. Strongly agree, somewhat agree, agree, disagree, somewhat disagree, or strongly disagree. Okay, if we can go ahead and pull up those results. Okay, so we had 18% strongly agree and 27% somewhat agree. So that gives us 45% strongly agree or somewhat agree. So I would really encourage you if you're in that category to um, attend those sessions on Tuesday and go ahead and email Brian Risley because we need to hear from you. 41%, the number one answer, just agree with the statement, but it looks like 11%, 14% either disagree or all the way to strongly disagree. So we're hoping that you're gonna get the information that you need today on your journey. And so you've heard about this quite a bit. So just let us know you're feeling right now. I can participate or I feel I can participate in the 75 minute regional service delivery session. Uh, for people with, H over, people with HIV over 50 in my county on this Tuesday. So you saw the times, you've got Brian's email. Do you think you will be able to participate? I just want to get an idea of how many people will be able to do it. Again, if you're in a non-Los Angeles county like San Bernardino, Riverside, Orange County, or San Diego, well, that's fantastic. So 49% Brian <laughs> say that they think they can participate. So go ahead and send Brian Risley an email. Uh, it is by invitation. And so, uh, but especially if you're in Palm Springs, other parts of Riverside, if you're in San Bernardino, Orange County, or San Diego, we really need to hear from you and your colleagues. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Brian who's gonna introduce our first speaker. Great, thank you, Tom. You know, our first presenter is Dr. Uh, Phil Peters. He's the medical officer for the California uh, Office of AIDS, California Department of Public Health. Dr. Peters will provide an epidemiological profile of HIV and aging in Southern California. Uh, welcome, Dr. Peters. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you, everyone. Um, give me a minute here to see if I can get the technology to work. Okay. I think I've started at the end of my presentation. Okay, so everyone is going to get to drink from the fire hose right here as I blitz through the presentation. And that was it. So I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but seriously, it's great to be here. It's great to be talking about this topic. Um, I am remembering last year when I had the chance to come down to um, APLA and, and talk about this and, and do some planning work. Okay. Can you, am I, can you hear me now? I'm just sorry. I'm just going to double check. We can hear you it great. Oh, good. Okay. I had a, I had a um, button showing that I was on mute, but maybe I wasn't. So. Okay, but anyway, this is a wonderful opportunity to be here. I feel very privileged to be among you, among all of the great speakers that are talking here. We are going, I'm going to present um, really a snapshot um, focused on uh, Southern California, um, trying to focus on people who are 50 years of age or older um, in living with HIV. 
Um, it's going to be a rapid review of um, a lot of this data, but I think a lot of this data is, is very familiar to a lot of you. Um, so I wanted to provide as much content as possible. So in this first slide on the map on the right um, is highlighting the, the federally designated in the HIV epidemic counties. Um, of course, we're working on HIV prevention and HIV care everywhere within California. But I think you can see within, this federal, within these federally designated areas, most of the counties in Southern California are actually part of that group. And hopefully that provides us another reason for a regional approach um, to HIV in general, more, more opportunities to collaborate. So for an overview, I was gonna break this presentation into five different parts. Uh, first, start with an overall snapshot, then provide a little bit of data just about people who um, were newly diagnosed with HIV in 2018, uh, then transition to some data about people who are living with diagnosed HIV within California, including some trends. Shift then to talk about some county level data um, and information. And finally wrap up with some data from the AIDS Drug Assistance Program. So you've, you've all seen this slide before. This is familiar data, but, uh, but presented for California. The red line is new diagnoses per year. The blue line is all cause deaths. And the gray bars are all people who are living with HIV. Um, I think you, I'll just let people look at this for a minute, but I think three points to make are one, the red line, new diagnoses are going down, but not going down fast enough. Uh, we still have quite a significant number of people who are being newly diagnosed with HIV per year. The blue mortality line uh, went down quite sharply with expansion of um, HIV antiretroviral treatment. Recently, probably since about 2010 in California, um, the all-cause number of, more, uh, of deaths has increased um, slightly. And I think that'll become apparent why that might be the case despite continued advances in HIV care over that time. Um, and then the gray bars, you can see that um, as there are still a, a significant number of people who become newly diagnosed per year, the number of people living with HIV in California um, grows each year. Here is a way to look at the snapshot of HIV. This is from our um, HIV health disparities report in California. Um, there's a web link there to the report. Um, as you can see, it is estimated that there are over 150,000 people living with HIV within California. Uh, approximately 90% um, of those people are aware of their diagnosis, but still a significant number of people who are not aware. If you combine any time um, someone is diagnosed with HIV, there is a query as to um, the most likely uh, um, transmission. And if you include male-to-male um, -male sexual contact and the combined male-to-male -male sexual contact and injection drug use, that accounts for 73% um, of all transmission categories within California. And then finally, if you look at age, um, this, uh, this uh, pie chart in the top right breaks down by age with 45 to 64 as the higher age group. We'll go into uh, more fine and more, more refined um, um, stratifications, but that age group represents um, over 50%, 54 0.5% of all people living with California, uh, living with HIV in California. So switching um, now to geography and new diagnoses per county, here are the 10 counties within California that had the highest number of new diagnoses in 2019. As you can see, the five counties with the highest number of new diagnoses um, are also five counties within Southern California. And when combined, this um, represents 61.4% of all diagnoses made um, in 2018. Now, shifting a little bit to talk about some of the state data for people who are newly diagnosed with HIV. This is um, the blue line on the bottom is the goal of our plan laying the foundation to get to zero. Um, that was implemented starting um, in 
2017, with a goal by 2021 to get to 2,500 new diagnoses. As you can see, we're only, this data only represents being within this plan for one year, but you can see there's a long way to go to get to that goal. And uh, the current trend lines would not lead us to um, accomplish this goal for quite a number of years. There has been some decline in the number of new diagnoses per year in California, uh, but it has not been dramatic. It's been relatively small. We can look at this information of new diagnoses uh, per year, and these are rates of new diagnoses per year per uh, population stratified by age group. Um, and so the, the rates of HIV infection um, and changes over time um, have not been um, consistent over different age groups. And if you actually look at the orange line that's in the middle, um, the orange line in the middle, these are people who are 45 to 54 years of age. And that group has actually had the largest decline um, when looking at rate of new HIV diagnoses over this uh, approximately eight, nine year period. Um, the younger group, 25 to 34, has actually seen an increase in new diagnoses per rate. This is now similar information on new diagnoses uh, by select counties, um, the five counties that Tom had um, discussed at the beginning. And you can also see that within the five counties, the five largest counties within Southern California, there also have been some different trends in new diagnoses. So within Los Angeles, there has been a significant decrease in new diagnoses from 2014 to 2018. This green line um, uh, below is San Diego County. There also has been a significant decline, uh, particularly from 2016 to 2018. These, the three counties, Orange County, Riverside, and San Bernardino, um, have had relatively consistent numbers of, of new infections uh, with a trend towards more new infections in San Bernardino County. Likewise, as we discussed that the decline in HIV infections has not been consistent uh, among age groups. It has not been consistent among um, um, uh, race, uh, racial and ethnic groups. So the blue line here represents the number of new um, HIV diagnoses per year in white Californians. That has declined quite significantly. Um, the red line on top represents new HIV infections in the Latinx community, and that has increased over the same time period. The bottom line for Black Californians has also decreased, but not at the same rate that it has decreased for white Californians. So again, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit now and talk about some of the, again, some of the data, but the data that relates more to how we're doing with care, how care is being received. So this is um, pulling back again to all California, all Californians who are diagnosed in a particular year, what percent um, achieved viral suppression within six months of their diagnosis. So our goal by 2021 is to get to 75%. And this is actually a goal that we um, appear to be on track to achieve. There still is a lot of work. And I think all of you know, working in the field, that um, some of the easier improvements happen first. Um, and it can be harder to get uh, to that goal of 75%, but some very significant process, progress has been made. Um, this is to kind of remind me though, that we were looking, that was looking at new diagnoses. And this is um, an age stratification of California comparing the age of people who are newly diagnosed with HIV, which are these uh, yellow oranges bars with all people living with HIV, which are these blue bars. Um, as you can see and, 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 and know from your work, uh, the majority of people newly diagnosed with HIV are in the 20 to 39 year um, age group. Um, however, with some significant uh, percentage, um, over 10% greater than 50 years of age were newly diagnosed. Whereas people living with HIV, uh, majority are now over the age of 50. So these next slides are dealing with um, 
uh, presenting data on the medical care for all people living with HIV within California. This now represents um, you know, much larger numbers of people who are over the age of 50. And here we're looking, we have a goal to have 80% viral suppression among all people who know their diagnosis of HIV within California by 2021. Um, this uh, metric is also increasing, but at a much slower pace. Um, and it would take a much longer time over, over 10 years for us to get to that 80% goal of viral suppression um, if we're not able to uh, you know, change this curve, uh, bend this curve upward. And likewise, as we looked with um, new diagnoses, um, the gains have not been equally distributed among different uh, racial and ethnic groups within California. Um, all groups have, um, all different um, race, ethnicity groups have increased, um, but white Californians have seen the biggest increase in viral suppression over this time uh, period. Um, in black Californians um, still, um, when looking at all black Californians living with HIV, um, have a lower rate of viral suppression. And finally, this is pulling it together, the care continuum um, of HIV care by age group among all people diagnosed with H living with diagnosed HIV in California. And you can see that the, that the small group of people um, who are um, in, the, in the pediatric group um, have very high rates of viral suppression. And then if you walk across from younger to middle-aged to older adults, um, the bar that's on the far right is the percent who have achieved viral suppression, and you see higher rates of viral suppression as you, um, um, as you move to higher um, age groups. Um, but even when you're at greater than 65 years of age, 69% of people have achieved viral suppression, but obviously that still leaves us short of our goal of 80% for the state. Um, and a lot of room for improvement. Now I'm going to turn and talk about some trends within California. So these are trends looking at um, finer, um, sorry, looking at finer stratifications of age and looking at those stratifications of age over time. And so we're starting um, in each age bracket in 2011 and moving into 2017. And I think there, there's um, two interesting, maybe three interesting observations. Um, one, if you, look at the, if you look at groups of people between the ages of 55 and 74, there is a rapid growth of those age groups, really almost in almost all of those categories, a doubling in the number of people. Um, in just in just seven years in each of those age stratifications. Two, if you look at the number of people who are over 75, that suddenly has become a very significant number of people. Over 2,000 people in California are over the age of 75 and living with HIV. So this is a um, intersection of um, age that is approaching the, um, you know, the median life expectancy of people in the United States, especially for men, um, and uh, chronic medical illness that people have had for um, likely 30 years plus uh, in this particular group. It's really a field of, of medicine um, that's new. And then I think the last point is if you look at the 50 to 54 group, uh, this group actually looks like we're stabilizing um, a little bit. And I'm hopeful that that is representing both uh, decline in new diagnoses among um, people who are um, in that 40 plus age group within California, um, and also um, a slow decline in number of people um, um, within California who are newly diagnosed with HIV. So hopefully as we move forward in the future, these bars will start to level off so that each year they're not, um, we're not seeing an increasing number of people within each age stratification. Um, here is looking at by rates, um, and I think you, you pretty much see the same pattern by rate, um, and this is per, one, per 100,000 people. 
Now, looking at, um, at the, those, those figures that we looked at before, we're basically looking at how age demographics are changing over time. And within different age stratifications, there are differences in demographics. And these demographics are going to increasingly become apparent over time. And so we could look at this a lot of different ways, uh, but here's, here's one way to look um, at, these, at this information. So if you look at uh, people who are living with HIV who are 60 to 64, currently within California, um, there are approximately twice as many people um, who are white versus people, compared with people who are Latinx. If we look at a younger age stratification, that ratio has um, completely flipped, that there are almost twice as many people who are Latinx um, compared with people who are white. And this is going, this is a shift in demographics that I know we're all aware of. Uh, and it's easier to be aware of than to properly plan for. And this is looking at similar data a little bit of a different way in breaking it down by different, um, um, different county. So for each county, this is comparing um, the proportion of people less than 50 compared with people greater than 50 who are Latinx. And I think you could see across each of the counties within um, Southern California, um, a majority of people living with HIV under 50 or close to a majority um, are Latinx who are under, under 50, sorry, under the uh, age of 50. Whereas if you look at people greater than 50, um, it's a much smaller percentage. So as people continue to age um, health um, with health, um, with HIV with health, um, our demographics are going to continue to change. And that is just one way to look at this, but there's, you know, you could, you could really look at this information in many different ways. Um, so this is the proportion of people living with HIV by the same age stratifications who are transgender women. And you can see there's a, a much higher uh, percent or proportion of transgender women who are less than 50 than over 50. Flipping, flipping that around, um, looking at the proportion of people who report injection drug use. So people um, who report injection drug use, that is actually higher among people who are over the age of 50 than people less than the age of 50 um, for a variety of reasons and, and hopefully partially because of um, um, improved opportunities for prevention and the syringe service programs um, in many of the counties in Southern California. Uh, finally, viral suppression. So this is, this is one area, um, with the exception of Riverside County, um, um, which has some unique demographics, uh, but, but this is one situation where you can see there's a lot of room to improve in both age stratifications. So people less than 50, people greater than 50, uh, there's slightly better rates of viral suppression, but we really need to make improvements across the board. So I'm gonna continue with uh, um, mixing it up a little bit, but continue to present some um, county level information. So this is, this is actually information um, for people who are um, men who have sex with men within uh, San Diego County who are either HIV negative um, or unaware of their HIV status. These are men who participated in the National HIV Behavioral Surveillance Study. Um, so that's a study that's done in a number of cities in the United States and recruits people um, and asks them lots of different questions to understand patterns um, of um, uh, information relevant for HIV risk, relevant for uh, PrEP use awareness, et cetera. Um, so this is one of the findings from their survey in 2017. They looked at different age stratifications and they looked at the proportion of men who reported condomless anal sex without the use of PrEP by different age groups. And you could see that the highest proportion um, who reported this were uh, in the 18 to 34 age group, um, but it actually was quite 
similar proportion among um, men who are in the 50 plus age group. So really, I think not knowing this data, I think um, um, you might have expected that it would, um, the proportion would decline with each age group, uh, but was quite similar in the 18 to 34 and 50 plus age groups. Mixing it up a little bit uh, again, uh, but presenting data from Los Angeles County. So this is um, switching back to um, our healthcare model. This is looking at trends in the cause of death among people living with HIV. So if you remember one of the, I believe it was uh, our third slide, sort of showed that the all-cause mortality for people living with HIV has been trending up since, uh, at a slowly but trending up since 2010. Um, this looks at the cause of deaths among people living with HIV in California. The darkest blue bars are causes of death that are directly related to HIV. So this would be um, causes of death related to uh, severe immune suppression, opportunistic infections, um, and above that are, are uh, people who have died from diseases related to the heart, so cardiovascular diseases. Um, above that are uh, people who had died from cancer, um, and above that are unintentional injuries, which are, um, you know, include both overdose deaths and automobile accidents, those type of um, causes of mortality. In the final bracket where it was in either, you know, the miscellaneous group of other or unknown. So you can see over time, um, antiretroviral therapy really, um, um, was began to be widely used in 1995. So there was a uh, rapid decline in deaths, a slower decline in the number of deaths that were attributable to HIV. But as you all are aware, those innovations in HIV treatment and care have continued to improve. And so over time, even from 2010 to 2018, the proportions of death uh, attributable to HIV declined from over 50% to 32%. To, um, um, so there are other causes of death that are, that are very important. And this is a paper from uh, Joel Gallant um, looking at people living with HIV compared with age-matched controls, basically showing um, that people with HIV have higher rates of many common um, comorb common uh, medical illnesses, including cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, um, um, osteoporosis of bones, liver disease, um, and higher um, numbers with cancer. And that, uh, to kind of wrap up the presentation, brings me to the ADAP program, uh, which is a program that needs to adapt to people getting older within California. Generally, when we think of ADAP, we think of younger people without insurance. This graph is to kind of show you that though we do see a bump in people enrolling in ADAP as you hit the age of 65. And that is because ADAP provides a lot of wraparound coverage for people who have Medicare insurance. So a very significant proportion of people receiving ADAP insurance coverage in California also have Medicare. It's about, if you look at this, it's about 8,000 people. Um, and when we look at ADAP enrollment by counties within California, uh, there, are some, there are also some interesting trends um, here. So this is, um, this is, I just kind of highlighted the point I wanted to make, but I think if you look, for example, at Los Angeles as maybe an example, there are over 12,000 people within Los Angeles who are enrolled in ADAP. That proportion is about the same as the proportion of people living with HIV in uh, Los Angeles. When we look at Riverside County, the proportion of people um, in ADAP is actually a little less than the proportion of people living with HIV within that county. Likewise, when we look at San Bernardino, which was the county that is having some increasing numbers of people being diagnosed with HIV, they also seem to be under-enrolled in ADAP. This is looking at the number of enrollment sites by county, and if you take Los Angeles as maybe the, the reference group, the, 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 uh, that's that you have 40% of people enrolled in ADAP or within Los Angeles, you have a lot of enrollment sites and a lot of enrollment workers. 
Orange County and Riverside County also have a significant number, over 5% of the people in the total program live within those counties. There are, however, only three enrollment sites for those 1,500 people, um, 16 and 14 enrollment workers, respectively. So to pull it together, um, that, that was, and I intentionally kind of ran through a lot of data just to try to just to try to, you know, really illuminate, um, highlight a lot of um, what is going on statewide and among people greater than 50, and in particular in Southern California. But to wrap it up, over 60% of people living with HIV in California reside in one of the five Southern California counties. 53% in, and increasing uh, percent of people living with HIV in California are over the age of 50. We have significant, we've made significant improvements in viral suppression statewide, but only small declines in the number of new HIV diagnoses. And we have quite significant disparities among Latinx and Black Californians. We've seen, there are also some geographic disparities where we've seen declines in new diagnoses most prominently in Los Angeles and San Diego. The number of people living with HIV is increasing in all of the age stratifications, especially greater than 55. And the race ethnicity demographics among older people living with HIV is changing and, is, and that change is likely going to accelerate in the next five to 10 years. The AIDS Drug Assistance Program will continue to involve, evolve um, with increased number of people who are co-covered with Medicare in an increased need to figure out the best, um, the optimal way to provide services um, for those people who have an increased need to treat comorbid illnesses. So I will stop there and thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Peters. That was a really excellent presentation that I feel like I need a cup of coffee and <laughs> sort of an hour just to, to digest it. There was a lot of great information there. And I think I'll start there just sort of generally, since you're so familiar with this data and you put together this presentation and you've probably been thinking about it, what were sort of two or three things that maybe surprised you when you were putting together this presentation? Yeah, the, the um, let's see, the one thing that, that did surprise me um, is looking at those age stratifications and seeing that there might actually, we might actually be reaching a point of um, equilibrium, um, certainly in the next 10 years, where right now we're in this phase of rapid growth of the number of people who are um, over the age of uh, 50. And I, it gave me a little bit of hope that we might start reaching a point where um, we are not accelerating the total number of people who are living with HIV within California. I think there's a lot of way to, a lot of room um, um, there, but, st but still that gave me a little bit of hope. Also, I think looking at the age stratifications, I, I was really struck by the number of people who, um, that we, we've often talked about people over 50, people over 55, it's a little bit of a uh, shifting terminology about what's the right group. Um, but it was really stri striking to see a number of people who are over 75. And I think um, as we're planning and trying to think of how we're going to approach medical services, um, it is likely going to be a very different approach for providing optimal care for somebody who is 50, 55, entering that age group where they're really starting to manage comorbidities you know, managing different types of screenings they might need to do, thinking about how they're gonna um, maintain health as they age versus people who are in that 75 plus age group where it really is a completely different um, 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 set of challenges that people have. Um, and a lot of us who have trained, um, uh, whether as, as doctors, nurses, community workers didn't necessarily have that focus when we were doing our training. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, the, the final point I think is the, um, you know, the shifting demographics. I, I think that's something we, we've all been aware of, but it was 
quite striking to me comparing people in the 60 to 64 age group to the 40 to 45 age group. It's really just 20 years apart and it's a fourfold change in the ratio. It went from twice as many um, um, people who are white to twice as many people um, who are Latinx. And that is, that is just such a, that is such a rapid change. And with all of the difficulty we have had as a society with um, racial justice, racial equity, it's hard to imagine that that, um, it's a great opportunity, obviously, but it's hard to imagine that that's not going to be a huge challenge um, for, for us as a community and in society more broadly. So we're going to be going between Brian and myself for questions. So Brian, you want to share the next question? Sure. Uh, Dr. Peters, um, I have a question from a gentleman I believe you know, uh, Kevin Sitter. Um, he would like to know if, if the increase in people living with HIV over 50 uh, will result in an increase in death numbers simply by natural mortality in the older population. And then how would you uh, delineate between um, people who um, died from natural causes and people who died from HIV related causes? Yeah, thanks, Kevin. That, that's a great question. Um, I think I presented some of the data from Los Angeles County, who I, I think they have really done a good job looking at cause of death. I'll just come out and say that as a state, we have not done as good of a job looking at cause of death. Cause of death information is not uh, perfect by any stretch, but I think if we can um, redouble our efforts to try to understand the reason people are dying, um, and if people are dying from, if people are dying from HIV-related complications. Um, that would raise a different alarm than people who are dying from cardiovascular disease, cancers that are not um, associated with um, uh, opportunistic infections or uh, problems with immune function. So I think, I think it, it is going to be a challenge, and, but I think it, it's, it's not going to be simply looking to see if people are getting to the age of 75 and then we don't have to worry anymore. Um, it's it's going to be a continual battle. And I kind of, I wonder, as I kind of alluded to this, that people living with HIV over the age of 75, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of uncharted territory. And there probably are things that we are going to learn that, um, that people living with HIV, having been exposed to certain antiretroviral medications, um, having had certain opportunistic infections, that may predispose to a different problem at the age of 75 um, than, a, than a person who's 75 that hadn't had HIV. So, so even among that group, we need to think about how do we, um, you know, what do we do to help people live healthy um, in that age group? And, and we're gonna need to be humble because I think we're gonna learn a lot in the next five, 10 years but how to do that better. Great, good, good answer. Thank you, Dr. Peters. The next uh, question is actually the shortest one, but I think it may kind of have the longest uh, answer. So Joe Green asks, how do these statistics compare with the uh, end the HIV epidemic EHE goals? And if I could just add a comment there, because we actually received the grant to um, work with Chicatelli and Associates in, in New York City, and we're reviewing all of the uh, 48 county plans right now and the um, seven state plans. And when people identify their target populations for their EHE programs, um, at least no one in any of the plans I reviewed have targeted people over 50. And so when you look at the statistics that you just presented, uh, Joe, with uh, your permission, I'll, I'll expand it a little bit. How do we not forget about people over 50 in our EHE plans and goals? Yeah, I, I think it's a great question. I think um, the EHE goals, um, as all of you know, um, you know, we, over the last five years, we've kind of all come up with these metrics. Um, I think they all, to be honest, I think they all, that there is similarity among them. 
Um, and I haven't really seen any particular, any city or state or county metrics. I've been like, well, that's kind of different or uh, that I would certainly that I would disagree with. I, I have not seen. So, so I think we are going to see with the, and the epidemic metrics, I think we're going to see everyone look again at their, at their metrics and, and try to see where does it make sense to harmonize? Um, but I think at the, the simplest one, maybe one of the more important ones, new diagnoses, the metric that California had, a lot of places had was to try to reduce by 50%. And that's the same metric that the, that the federal land uh, plan has for the, for the next five years. So, so I, think, I think there is a lot of harmony there. Um, Tom, I think to your point, it's, it's such a great point because I think, um, you know, when I was thinking about this presentation, it was like, okay, I gotta like really make this specific to uh, greater than 50. But then you take a step back and you, and you say, that's actually, you know, that's actually the majority of people. So <laughs> they could just present everything. And I don't think that, you know, when we go, when you go to sort of audiences, they're not thinking as much about HIV. You talk about HIV, they're not thinking about people over 50. They're thinking about someone who's young. And I, that, I think as educators, that's going to be something that we do need to focus on. Um, and I know we have a lot of great groups here who provide services to, to people in general over the age of, uh, of 50. And I think we definitely need to uh, reach out and learn from them, uh, learn what their lessons and kind of educate them about what's going on um, with people living with HIV. And I think even myself as a reviewer of plans, when I see we're targeting, say, African-American, uh, bisexual, and gay-identified men, I probably don't picture over 50 in my head, but that's inclusive in that group. And so I think it's something we just sort of have to practice doing. So Brian, you have the next question? Yes. Um, from San Bernardino County, how do we explain the increase of HIV infections in San Bernardino County? Yeah, great, great question. I think um, one another thing when I was putting this presentation together is that um, it's all well and good to look at these big picture statistics. I think they are very informative. They're they're necessary for policy, um, but what often moves people are anecdotal stories about what you know what is an individual person's experience. And I think you could probably tell me a lot about individual people's um, experiences. And one, one thing I really, um, you know, one thing that I do like about that the federal plan identified five Southern California counties is it provides this opportunity to work together as when you're, you know, flying into um, Southern California, you don't see a regional boundary there is a large metropolitan area and there is a housing crisis. People are moving from one county to another county, uh, particularly younger people. Um, and um, I think I saw a comment from Jeff, uh, uh, as well as older people are moving to certain communities that make more sense to retire in, that, are, that make more sense to age in, um, in a healthy manner. So I don't, I'll be, I'll be, you know, just as honest as I can with you, I do not know, and I would love to know the answer to that question, but I think it does represent broader shifting demographics within Southern California. And I'll, you know, I'll leave it at that, because I think there are people that can know, that know a lot more about that than I do who are, um, that are in this meeting. And it was interesting that in the polling, so many people identified housing as a primary concern. And a lot of that too is why people are moving to other more affordable locations. So the next question, it's kind of in real time. You probably don't have a lot of data, but maybe you've got some anecdotes to share with us. It's from Dr. Octavio Vallejo. Um, do you have any information at the state level about COVID-19 and the HIV community focusing on people over 50? Oh, well, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> have you been thinking uh, about COVID at all? Yeah, I do. You want me to pull up a slide on that? Sure. Uh, let's see. Dr. Vallejo gets his own slide presentation. <laughs> um, and don't forget uh, to share the screen when you pull that up. 
Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's, I think it's going to be, I think I might have closed it out, but I, um, I'll, I'll send it to you, Tom, because we did. Yeah. So anyway, we, we did early on, this is, so this is uh, the caveat is this is before um, the July, August bump in COVID within California. So this is sort of the, this is kind of that early first wave where we, you know, we're preemptively patting ourselves on the back a little bit too much before COVID really, um, really became a, a massive problem in California. So we looked among um, people who are being diagnosed with COVID um, to see how many people um, uh, were also diagnosed with HIV. What is so interesting that what we saw is that the, if you looked at it by uh, proportion of population, um, people living with HIV were about twice as likely to be diagnosed with COVID. But then when you looked at rates of hospitalization, intensive care, or death, it was the same if you, if you age matched versus uh, the general population in California. So I think uh, we don't know exactly why that was the case. My bias was that uh, providers were more likely to do testing for if they had a particular client with HIV, they, were more, they had a lower threshold to test. And that was a time where we had very limited testing in the state. Um, but the clinical illness, at least among that relatively small number of people, um, didn't seem to be appreciably different. So that's one answer. The, the other, we want to now look at that again, now that there's more people um, have obviously had COVID in California. Um, there is data from South Africa that's showing um, higher rates of hospitalization and mortality. Uh, but there's also data from New York City that did not show that. So I think it's, it's a little bit of a, an open question. I think it is important, though, um, with all this vaccine work that's being done, it's quite clear that you need both uh, functional antibodies, you need functional CD8 cells, um, and you need functional CD4 cells. So it's hard to imagine that people who have not had... Um, in extreme um, uh, depletion of CD4 cells, um, even if they've been able to recover that pretty well with antiretroviral therapy, um, that, um, that COVID uh, might be a more severe infection. And also we might not be, whenever a vaccine does become available, we obviously want to um, uh, vaccinate everyone, but we might not be able to rely on the vaccine efficacy as well among people living with HIV. And I think a lot of you saw that um, almost all of the initial protocols were excluding people with HIV. Fortunately, um, APLA, lots of, lots of advocates made a, a stink about that and, and rightfully so, um, and those protocols were changed. But I do wonder how many people they've actually been able to um, enroll in clinical trials and, and um, you know, what information they're gonna have. Great, thank you. Great. Um, any particular programs or resources by the State Office of AIDS to assist uh, Black or Latinx uh, people um, with the aging population? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Our I think our newest initiative, and I'll and I'll confess that um, what Tom said really resonated about how we don't usually think of people who are aging. So our newest initiative. Um, is, uh, is Project Empowerment. And Project Empowerment is um, a prevention-oriented um, um, funding that has been given to 15 organizations um, around California that primarily provide prevention and uh, linkage to care services um, for Black Californians, Latinx Californians. Um, I will confess that I don't think we have a lot about people over the age of 50 in there. Um, and, and that is obviously um, a huge part of that work. So, so I'm taking from these questions that uh, we need to go back and kind of think about that project. Um, um, because it is, I mean, honestly, it is just, it's a bias that uh, I have and and I think um, is not that uncommon, that that's not what we're thinking when we're designing projects. Um, 
the other program that I that I um, that we really that I think we really need to think about for people, and, and we have been thinking about a lot for people over the age, especially over the age of 65 is the ADAP program. Traditionally, it's really been geared towards younger people who just haven't had insurance, but with ACA that, you know, hopefully that is not going anywhere. Um, that has changed a little bit and there, and there is this opportunity to work more with Medicare. And so that is for the ADAP program, um, which serves a large number of uh, Latinx and Black Californians. I think that's going to be a real opportunity in that, especially in that older 65 plus age group to help. Great, thank you. I think the next question is going to ask, it's ask you, asking you as a, more as a clinician than an epidemiologist. Uh, this person says, the older adults I see in clinical practice seem less likely to speak about sexual health and are often uh, resistant to additional education or prevention information. Um, the person asks, how can I improve my messaging, but I can, how can we all improve our messaging on HIV treatment and prevention options to be inclusive of older adults? Yeah, I, I would, it's a great question, because I think, um, you know, I'm just take, taking a step back and, and thinking as a medical provider, you know, one, medical providers are not very comfortable about talking about sex. Uh, two, regardless of, you know, what a particular person's, um, you know, particular person's private life is, they like to present themselves um, as, a, as a clinician, as somebody who is a fountain of, you know, knowledge and is, in a, and I think that kind of comes across that you don't really talk about sex if that's what you're doing. Um, three, I think providers are under a tremendous amount of pressure to get people in and out of practice, and, uh, in and out of their appointments. And there's, if you actually provided every primary care service that's recommended, you'd be seeing every patient for an hour and you have 12 minutes uh, to see everyone. So there's all these forces that are conspiring against us asking people um, about their sexual health. And, um, and I think um, really the best advice has been to not just rely on things like a, a little form that people fills out, or for example, to just say like, you know, how when somebody comes in and you've been seeing them for, um, you know, 20 years, don't necessarily just say, well, how's, um, how's Joe do, how's your husband Joe doing? And that's, and they say fine. And then that's like your sexual conversation. Because <laughs> maybe I'm not having sex with Joe anymore, but I'm having sex with a, a number of other people. And same so, for substance use disorders. You know, people don't think of, you know, over 50, over 60, over 70 as maybe having a math problem. Yes. Yeah. So people, people continue to have sex as they're older. I think people I think there, I think as we saw with one of the um, slides that I presented, that sometimes as we, as we age, we think we kind of, um, I don't know if it's like becoming a teenager again, but we feel like we're, we kind of have a lot of wisdom now and we can tell, well, I don't really need to use a condom anymore because, uh, you know, I'm very aware of the situation that it's not like I'm a, I'm a you know, young person making all sorts of mistakes. I know exactly what I'm doing. So, so I think, um, I think there's really no substitute though for the open-ended question if you if you don't ask and if you're not willing to provide a little time for what might be a very complex answer um, then it's hard to provide adequate sexual health um, but if you but if you actually take a step back and think about what's going to help somebody age with health that's super important because you know it's important for people's mental health, it's important to prevent um, isolation, it's important for their biological health that they have a, a, a healthy um, sex life as they age. Great, thank you. Tom, you wanna field, field one? I think that was my question. Oh, um, sorry, um, sure. Uh, we have a lot of great questions here. Um, and I think we touched on this a little bit, but according to the CDC, older people are less likely to get tested for HIV and are more likely than younger people to have late stage HIV infection at time of diagnosis. 
What are the underlying factors behind this disparity? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, I wanted to kind of talk, touch, talk about that two ways. Um, one, I think we have to look at our system as, as, as providers, as people who are providing services. Um, I've already, you know, I've already seen my bias. I've kind of seen bias in the way that we implement our prevention programs. Um, we don't really think of people over the age of 50 as um, newly acquiring HIV infection. Um, and if we look at the big picture numbers, that can, that can actually reinforce that belief. You look at the, the numbers of people who are being diagnosed, most people are in those younger age groups, but a significant number of people are over the age of 50. And, um, and it is really a failure of our system if we haven't made a diagnosis within time to provide timely treatment to protect someone's immune system, uh, to protect their health so that they can age with health. Um, you know, from, from the perspective of an individual, I don't, I don't know, I don't think I necessarily want to go there because there's just so many different, for any individual, there's so many different you know, motivations. And there might be, you know, one particular person, they might live with a lot of stigma. Another particular person might not be open about talking about their, um, about who they have sex with um, to other people. So there are, I think there are many, there are many reasons, but I think we need to step back as a, um, as a system and think, well, how can we make those spaces safe so that people feel like they, um, because um, often people who are over 50, many people do have access to health care and do have insurance. So how can we pr make that space safe so that they can take advantage of the services that they have? The, so the final point I want to make is that with COVID, we're seeing a lot more home testing. And I am actually curious that people who traditionally have been diagnosed in later stages, whether they're older or not, perhaps with access to home testing, where you can, in a relatively anonymous way, receive a home HIV test kit, perhaps that will lead to more people being comfortable getting the test done. And then once you have that information for the test, then that, that makes it a lot more real and you can kind of hopefully see a path forward to access care. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Peters, we have time for one more question. Uh, this actually comes from Jules Levin in, in New York. Do you have data on the percent of uh, people living with HIV with frailty in Southern California and, and physical impairment um, and or disability? We probably, I don't have it off the top of my head. We do, um, like it's done around the country, we, do, we participate in the medical monitoring project, which is a it's both a nationally representative sample of people living with HIV. It's kind of biased towards people who are in care, but that's uh, kind of the best we have. And it has questions um, um, about frailty and per percentage of people with frailty. What I've generally seen, um, and this is just a general observation, that, the, that people who are currently um, over the age of uh, 60 um, living with HIV have, the f have similar rates of frailty as people who are about 10 years older um, who are not living with HIV. So uh, we have, um, within California, we, as a percentage-wise, as a total number of people, we have very high numbers of people um, who are older living with HIV. And so, um, um, so sort of the, this, the, the simple answer without the, without the number is that those numbers are, are quite high. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Peters. We really appreciate um, your thoughtful answers to some really good questions. So thank you, everybody, for excellent uh, questions. And thank you, Dr. Peters. Again, uh, we'll be posting Dr. Peters' slides um, after the conference. And... Uh, I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Uh, so we're pleased to introduce 
a national expert on HIV and aging, Dr. Stephen Karpiak. Dr. Karpiak has done substantive research on this topic, and he helped launch the nation's first comprehensive needs assessment for older adults uh, living with HIV. Dr. Karpiak is the senior director for research at um, Gay Men's Health Crisis in New York City, and he's the director of the National Resource Center for HIV and Aging. The center recently launched their first webinar last week with Dr. Anthony Fauci. Uh, welcome, Dr. Karpiak. Thank you for that introduction, uh, and thank you, uh, Dr. Peters, for that uh, data, epidemiology data. I always think that if I had it to do all over again, I would uh, become an epidemiologist uh, because they have enormous amounts of data, most of which they don't have to collect, and uh, but it's already there, and it really provides enormous insights, as you can see today, into the status, not just of the HIV epidemic, but uh, these days, the COVID epidemic. Um, let me get my slideshow going here. So, it, can you see the slideshow? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, good. Okay. So, um, you know, I, uh, I know many of you here today, and you've heard me speak before, and I'm going to go over some data you've heard before, and I'm going to try to interject some nuance into all of this. I think that all of us realize that we're kind of in an unknown territory, uh, which is not really new. In fact, aging is an unknown territory in, in and of itself, but it's been complicated because of HIV, but also because of COVID. And uh, the COVID impact is not all that clear yet. Uh, if I can take just a moment to comment a little bit, we really don't know how much the uh, HIV older adult population has been impacted by COVID. But some data is emerging, and some of it is surprising. Uh, in the beginning of the epidemic, we thought that people with compromised immune system, which includes the of HIV, uh, would be more susceptible, and particularly older adults, because they exhibit the comorbidities of aging, which places them at increased risk for COVID, uh, which is true in the general population. But uh, in fact, uh, data from New York uh, City and from uh, Florida uh, shows that uh, the rates of COVID infection in the HIV population older are not really different from the uh, standing population when matched for age. So that should surprise a lot of folks, and it did. And there are some rationales for that. Number one, we don't see the differences in care or outcomes for health outcomes across white, Latinx, and African-American groups as compared to the larger population where those groups particularly Latinx and African American, were at higher risk, evidencing higher rates of COVID infection and death rate. So we're not seeing that in, in the HIV population, or at least we're not seeing it to that large an extent. Why? Part of it is because these folks are in care. So in the larger population, the minority groups are not in care or are not in as consistent percent of care, whereas the HIV population have been in care and they remain in care or they get connected to care more rapidly because of support systems. So that's one explanation why we don't see these differentials across ethnic groups. The other one is that uh, there's evidence to show that the uh, cytokine storm, which is what the virus causes in the lung, soft lung tissue and really is, is what causes the severe uh, illnesses or associated symptoms and death in this population. And for some reason that cytokine storm is not fully occurring. And this could be because of the relationship of HIV to the immune system. That's speculative. The other reason is that we know, and I've been preaching this since I began this research back in 2002, the older adult with HIV is socially isolated. You know, it's social separation. That's uh, avoiding other contact with other people. They are by their very nature, and it's built into their behavior patterns, uh, which heretofore we thought were maladaptive, but now for the COVID virus, it may be adapted. Uh, but this is speculative, we're waiting for more data. But uh, in some larger uh, studies, including France and uh, in um, the Netherlands, similar data has emerged. So there's something to be said for being not only protected because of social isolation, which we call social distancing in this case, and because the majority of people with HIV are in care, regardless of their ethnic background. Dr. Karpiak, we want to yes. 
Make sure you're advancing your slides. Okay, yeah, right. I'm just speaking over the mic. <laughs> I just wanted to comment on it, especially having heard Dr. Fauci speak last Thursday, and because we're too, like everyone else, looking for data about COVID. But we'll Great, get back to that. So we know the number of older adults is, uh, is increasing. We heard that today from Dr. Peters. And you know, it, it may be a repetitious, but I must tell you, I've been doing this work since 2002. I still have to tell people that story. Uh, and, and it surprises me. I think it's good all ages and raising his head, but we know that by the last part of next dec of this decade, uh, by 2030, 70% in general across the board in the U.S. will be over the age of 50, very large numbers. And half of these are older adults or older adults, long-term survivors or thrivers, as some people use uh, say today. These are folks born before the advent of uh, effective ART, which is around 1996. So here, epidemiology data. First, I want to talk about the USA in general. These are the number of people living in HIV over the age of 50. And then the next slide are the percent. And these percent continues to increase every year, as you can see. Uh, and then we have deaths. That's our numbers. These are in the USA. You can see here, as was just mentioned a few minutes ago, we expect deaths to increase in an older population, and that's what we're seeing. As the older population dominates the epidemic, we see more deaths in the, in the 50 plus. Yet recently, uh, California uh, has been has now the highest number of people living with HIV of about 128,000 plus. Uh, I think New York State has about 124,000 plus, but we, we quibble here. But they have very California has very high rates. Uh, and most are white, MSM. Uh, the second largest group is Latinx, so 48,000. These are really very, very high numbers, and uh, they will increasingly impact the demands on the delivery of care uh, to this aging population. You know, in general, it's estimated that 70%, 70% of all healthcare costs in the United States are associated with aging. Terribly sorry to interrupt you. There's a um, gray screen that's part on your slide. Um, I think you maybe have another window that's open. Oh, yeah, if that's my. Uh, hang on. Share your Close Is that going? Away? That's better. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, Actually, Stephen, there's still one over to the right and at the very top. Um, yeah, and I see it. Blo blocking some of your data earlier. Okay, I'll get rid of it or I'll move it. How's that? That was much better, thank you. Okay, no problem. Um, that, I, this is probably, God knows, my 50th Zoom presentation. In fact, I did one two nights ago for uh, Kiev and Odessa, which is interesting. I have been in Ukraine. Uh, let me just go back here for a second. Um, uh, I lost my mouse. I'm going to go back to where it was. Okay, here we go. Okay. So we've talked about uh, uh, why is it that we do not uh, focus any prevention efforts on the people over the age of 50 who are at risk? And, uh, show has its online now. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm just going to stop the slideshow for a moment here and talk about this. In New York City, we have had a program called Ages on a Condom, and we've been actually mounting this campaign for the last 10 years. And this is thankful, thankfully to the funding that comes from the New York City Council. Very little funding has come from the CDC for this population, aging population. In fact, I think I can count on three fingers the number of studies that have been funded by either CDC or NIH looking at uh, why there are higher rates of, uh, uh, continued higher rates of infection in the aging population over age 50. Uh, the average around uh, 15 to 18 percent per year, which is a fairly high number if you think about it. And some communities it's as high as 24 percent, and other communities it's as low as 14 percent. So these are uh, um, let me say it, these are high numbers that have largely been ignored. And as was mentioned before, we can't get to the EHE uh, uh, criteria. We can't end the epidemic unless we focus on the older adults. Uh, with HIV or those who are at risk who are older. Uh, I'm not sure why that's not happening, but it isn't. And one of the other reasons that's, I, well, I stopped my slides here, bear with me 
some reason it was going automatically, is that the rate of new uh, AIDS infection, AIDS diagnosis, is considerably higher, as much as seven times higher in the older adult with HIV upon diagnosis. They have a dual diagnosis. What does this mean? It means that we haven't focused prevention efforts on people who are older, and and uh, testing is not occurring at rates that it should be, which is why the chances of a person over age 50 being diagnosed with HIV and AIDS when, it's, when initially tested are extremely high. It's really these, the fact that this population has fallen through the cracks and we can point to lack of testing. Another reason is as we watch infection rates drop in the other, age, other uh, population below age 50 is the use of PrEP. There are very few or any sustained campaigns to, uh, to uh, educate and to, uh, to encourage people over the age of 50 to use PrEP, be your male or female. So I think these are deficits in, and structurally in the system that have to be changed, some of them are culturally driven, of course. Uh, I think the basis of most of it is ages. Uh, I, I, I was, it was fascinating to listen to Dr. Peters say and admit that physicians do not like to talk about or take a sexual history. Uh, one would think that this long into the HIV epidemic, one would. Uh, Dr. Park, who's up at uh, University of California, San Francisco, presented some really very compelling data showing that the older adult population in general is showing higher STI rates, STD rates, particularly syphilis, syphilis and chlamydia. And these used to be indicators for HIV increase in, increases in HIV infection. So something has changed. Uh, boomers are different than uh, the population ahead of them, and boomers are different than the population behind them. So these are cultural, attitudinal changes that we really have not adjusted to in HIV prevention uh, here in the USA, and we need to do that. And uh, like anything, the more we talk about it, the more people will accept it. You know? uh, I'm going to continue here. Hopefully, this will kind of slow down. Uh, okay. This was the rate of uh, infection in males over the age of 50, uh, what percent of all HIV diagnosis. And you can see in black and Latinx have the highest rates. And here are uh, the same thing in females. Unfortunately, often too often, too often forget about females, but they account for 25% of all people living with HIV and generally all people diagnosed with HIV. Now, I have to stop this here. Um, some reason my PowerPoint has run away. Uh, I want to go over death rates here, and they were alluded to by Dr. Peters, and you're, normally I don't look at these rates, not because it's morbid, but because I really haven't been able to tell us very much. But if you look here on the left side, and I know I'm blocking part of it because I'm stopping the show here, but HIV-related deaths as a percent of total deaths over time, and this goes from around 2004 to 2017, uh, the uh, uh, axis is blocked. You can see that the HIV-related deaths goes down from 63% about 15 years ago to 28% in 2018. This is an enormous drop in HIV-related deaths. And yet non-HIV-related deaths goes from about, I think it's 24% all the way up to today, or 2018, 17, 71%. And these are data from New York City. And the reason I take it, because not because I'm a New Yorker, but because they really have some of the best epi data uh, in the USA and always have, although California is uh, certainly no slouch in that. So if you just kind of keep this data in mind, if we look at the next slide, um, this slide visually shows what's going on. If we look at the red bar uh, back in 2002, why is it doing this? Excuse me, I got to stop. I just want one, one second, please. I really want to get back on the queue here. Um, okay. I'm not going to, you're going to live with this smaller picture. Um, anyhow, looking back at this, the red bar here shows that in 2002, this is New York City data, the number of percent of deaths that were related to HIV was 63%. By 2016, that went down to 28%. And more recent data shows it a lot dropping below 20%. An enormous decrease in morbidity related to the virus. Enormous decrease. And yet, if you look at deaths related to non HIV, which in 2002 was 34%, in 
and going up to 72%, actually 78% as of 2018 in New York City. This is a switch, okay? There's a serious switch in the clinical uh, status of the HIV patient, particularly the older HIV patient. And it speaks to the challenge of the, of the workforce. I sit on a CFR uh, at Albert Einstein and Rockefeller and I'm surrounded by young physicians who are just getting their MD and they want to treat HIV, that's their, their goal. If they don't stay in the USA, they go abroad, most to Africa, but to other countries because treating HIV in the USA has become, like most industrialized country, uh, countries, a fairly straightforward phenomenon. I'm not saying it's not complicated, but it's easier. So if you were a physician way back when, say 19 or 2000, and you signed up to be an MD or an ID doc or an HIV treating doc, that's what you want to do, treat HIV. You didn't sign up to treat cancer, growing disease, uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, worry about frailty, et cetera. That's not what this population of, of care providers signed up for. And therefore, the workforce, people treat people with HIV is, is going down and across the country. So this is a serious problem and needs to be addressed not only at a national level, but at a local level. Or, and it's not an MD, maybe it's an NP or some other clinician who can intervene and treat people with HIV. It's been suggested by people who are working the New York State AIDS Institute, where they put out standards of care that uh, it's believed that the primary care physician or ID treating doctor HIV should largely be looked upon as experts who will be called in when needed when there's complication uh, of the data. So moving forward, uh, I want you to look at some numbers here. You're going to be patient with me. There, if you look at the cause of death in the first line, look at the numbers. This is again going from 2002 to 2016. That in, that 63% had HIV-related deaths. Okay, and now we're going down to 28% in the last few years. What are those deaths related to? What are they? Why are they happening? And if you look at the non-HIV-related deaths, which go from 34 to 71, yes, that these are related to cardiovascular disease increases, cancer increases, accidental overdoses, infectious, other infectious diseases, external causes like falls, uh, and uh, other, other illnesses, other comorbid illnesses. So we're watching an aging population that characteristically have increases in cancer, cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, mental health problems, uh, particularly in dementia, uh, et cetera. They are not untypical of any aging population. So we expect to see more cases of, uh, of comorbidity that are associated with aging. But, and I mean, this is a, an observation that I've made with colleagues from CDC and starting to look at other data from other areas. This is the trends in the major cause of death with people with HIV in New York City. If you look at this carefully, in 2003, there were 2,902 deaths. If you go to 2017, the number each year keeps going down. And in fact, in 2017, it was 1,759. So we have an aging population that's exhibiting high rates of comorbidity, particularly cancer and cardiovascular disease, and yet, in fact, the total number of deaths is going down. I can only speculate about what this means, and others are trying to, but we don't have any firm answer. But maybe, just maybe, that people who are, have HIV as they're aging and they, sustain, are they are in sustained care and very good care at that, and are being more aware of their suppression of the virus, maybe, just maybe, their health is really rather good compared to others in the general population. It's total speculation, but there are ways of hope here that you know, just because you're getting older with HIV doesn't mean that you're gonna to succumb to uh, any other illness because you have HIV and it's gonna occur earlier. It's not necessarily the case. In fact, the vast majority of people living with HIV are in considerably good health compared to others who are not. But uh, I think that we have to kind of not panic too much here. Uh, we should be concerned and we should be, we'll talk about it later, but we need to uh, advance the thought, the positive thought 
that maybe, just maybe the HIV patient is in a better position than most when it comes to aging and particularly in the context of this epidemic. So we know this, this slide I've shown many times before, the complication of success, that, that title comes from the paper published uh, back in uh, the late uh, 2008, I think it is. And these are the primary comorbid conditions we see in this population. And there's nothing unusual here, cancer, non-AIDS, cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, et cetera, including frailty, which has been mentioned here as well. These are all chronic conditions. And you know, if you have two or more chronic conditions, you're, you're said to have multimorbidity. Uh, multimorbidity occurs in the general population just like it does in the HIV aging population. But there are differences of as to why they occur. And we really have to be aware of this. If you look at the risk factor for multimorbidity in the HIV patient, you find that it's not just HIV, but this population has a history of smoking, substance use, alcohol use, even at moderate and low levels, poor nutrition, little or no exercise, co-infections with hep C, hep B, the cumulative uh, uh, stress of unmanaged depression, social isolation, which is a defensive behavior because of AIDS-related stigma, not working because of the benefits that accrue to this population, but they're in a cash 22, they like to make more money, but they can't because they'll lose the benefits. But not working is a very, very powerful factor in any analysis we do of data. Uh, working imparts purpose in life. Uh, there is obesity, particularly in women, it's on the rise. We know stigma, I mentioned aging, but we have also age, ageism, but also HIV related stigma is alive and well. We need, we need, we need to find a way to help people with HIV stand up and be counted, otherwise stigma will never go away. And loneliness is highly associated with the high rates of depression we see, and being a sexual minority, and food scarcity. Every single one of these is a stressor. Every single one of these factors is a risk to the comorbidities of aging. And yet, there's only one here, only one, that relates to HIV, and that's HIV infection, and which can be not treated to cure a stage, but at least suppress if one takes one of the medication. So the picture is far more complex. When we say an older adult living with HIV, and we end our sentence there, we're not doing them justice. Yes, they are living with HIV. Yes, they are long-term survivors, but they also bring with them, excuse me, a lot of baggage. And it's a lot of baggage that I think that could have been avoided if we only considered more about what, what, what it did it mean to give people a life-saving drug, say way back in the 90s, and then leave them alone, and not consider all the other factors, the social determinants of aging, all the other things that go into good health. We really, really, really isolated ourselves for our focus of clinical care was on the virus to the exclusion of everything else, uh, at least effective uh, management. So I think as we're rewriting the, uh, the Ryan White Care Act, and that is being done by several people in this country, uh, there's a need to look at these risks and consider them as being part of the health, the total health of this population. It's not just about HIV. Why? Okay. Well, there's some very crass reasons in, in today's culture. Uh, one is uh, uh, inclined to look at cost, annual cost of treatment, for one HIV patient with comorbidities in California. And this goes from zero, one, two, lower left corner, up to as many as eight to 10, 11 comorbid conditions. Uh, these are not unusual. Having five or six is not unusual in this population. You can see the cost per excuse me, year go up drastically from 30,000 up to over $200,000 a year. And in fact, that number increases even more if the person is assigned to a long-term care facility. So I want to present now some data that from our large across the USA uh, study of older, uh, older adults with HIV called Rowan. And we have done the study, as many of you know, in San Francisco and Oakland, the other two cities, as well as in Chicago and in older adults in New York City and in older adults in upstate New York, which is largely rural. Now, there are about mm, 2 million data points in this study 
in this, and we're just harmonizing the data. But I want to give you a flavor for what these are basically needs assessment of the older adult HIV across the USA. And there's some general observations I want to make before I look at some specific data. One of them is it's very hard to find gender differences in this in the data we collect. Why is that? I think the HIV is such a great equalizer that the gender factor or gen the contributing factor of being gender, being male, female, trans, doesn't show up in the data. It's there, but I don't think it shows up in the data easily. Because the impact of HIV is so considerable, it washes all other factors out. Again, that's the speculation. In fact, when we first started collecting data on HIV and aging, uh, my mentor was a uh, emerita Marge Kander who wrote the book on caregiving and aging, and uh, she was really shocked by the lack of gender differences, which are seen in other aging uh, data sets with relative ease. So this data is now being analyzed and provide researchers like myself and my colleagues like with five, 10 years worth of data. But I wanna pick out some things that stood out to us in looking at this data. One of them is sexual abuse, and which is related to PTSD. This has never been really measured before, and I think that you have data in California and other areas where we're seeing the evidence that PTSD rates are approximately like 25 to 35 percent in this population of older adults. These are very, very, very high rates. You only see those rates in people who come out of uh, uh, military action in, the, uh, in, the, in our armed forces. And they can be related to sexual abuse that occurred largely uh, later in life, uh, later in teenage years. And you can see here the percentages, uh, fondling, force touching, or rape and attempted rape is around uh, 40%. It's a very, very, very high number. And that number is almost the same regardless of gender. Think about it. Uh, it's, it's, I think that's a very, very unique observation. Uh, the other, one, the other one is a very simple observation. I, I've been fortunate enough to work in uh, teaching, medical teaching hospitals for most of my research career, initially at Columbia Medical, now I'm a faculty at NYU, and uh, I do a lot of work at Cornell Medical and Einstein here in uh, New York. We, if you ask a person, how are you today? You open the door and you shake their hand, or you can't shake their hand anymore, you say, how are you today? How that person responds tells you an enormous amount about their health status. And if they respond on good health or excellent health, that's a good thing, and you should take it for face validity. It's real, it's reality. It's the person reporting back to you. But look at here in the, in our, this is from San Francisco and Oakland data, that about, you know, uh, what, four or five, 53, 58% said, okay, good or excellent. But you know, there's 40 some odd percent here who are saying very poor or very poor. Listen, those are not good numbers. They are impacting half of the, the population we sampled. We have to look at this. Why are this population who is largely connected to care and many who have been connected to care for many years, why are they reporting such fair, poor, very poor uh, uh, status? I don't know the answer to that, but we should find out why. Substance use. Um, the history of substance use in this population is considerable. This is data from uh, the ROA data set, but both again in uh, Oakland and in San Francisco. Canada. Marijuana use, these are numbers uh, high, 152. There's a reduction, the next bar, the lighter green bar. You can see there's a reduction over time. You get from younger to older, you stop using uh, substances. Uh, and cocaine, considerable drop. Hopper is considerable. Now look at methamphetamine. Drop is not as great there, and use is not as great there. Uh, this is a great concern. And I've been interviewing psychiatrists in uh, medical centers across the USA and asking them what they are encountering in the older adult with HIV. And what they say is they're watching an increased use of substances. People are reverting back to mostly amphetamine, but also uh, 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 cocaine and other opioids. And they're doing it even though they might have been dependent on them or never really used them very much or for only a recreational purpose, why? They are starting to use them again. And the answer is they're seeking social integration. They want to engage other people with HIV, be they older adults or younger adults. 
who have HIV or who might be at risk for HIV. I think it's really important for all uh, communities to start looking at that dynamic between the younger person and the older person. And it's like the spring summer marriages, you know, the older woman and the younger uh, 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 adult. Uh, there, are, there is a dynamic that cuts across ages that really, really has never been studied in the HIV epidemic. And I think the time is right to do that. Self-report mental disorder. Uh, in ROA, we had many measures of mental disorder, but you know, ask someone, you just say, have you been diagnosed with anxiety, depression, bipolar? And you can see the rates here are very high, 60 plus percent. This is three to five times rates seen in the typical population, controlling for age, in the general population in the USA. I think these are embarrassing numbers. Uh, depression is an eminently treatable disorder, eminently treatable. Having spent uh, 25 years of my life on faculty at Columbia and appointments in psychiatry and immunology, I know depression is treatable. But what happened to this population? Where did, where did, we, miss, where did we miss managing depression in this population? Because depression is a, really a drag on every quality of life you can imagine. Yeah, I think about it sometimes, and I think you haven't heard the story, but imagine you are uh, 30 years old, and you have people dying all around you back in 1992. Okay? And it's scary. I lived in that period of time. Many of you here have as well. And you almost didn't want to even say hello to anyone or know what someone's going to tell you next on the phone or on the street that they were diagnosed. And you know after a diagnosis back then, your lifespan was very short, likely a few months. So this population is moving forward. And then in 1995 or early part of the 90s, they have ant effective antiretrovirals are out there. They're available. Life now goes from two months duration to a full lifespan, which we're watching people do today. And it's because of effective antiretrovirals that we have an aging population today. So what happened? We have people on ADAP, Ryan White funded programs, whatever, and they're suddenly given a drug that gives them life. This is an extraordinary achievement. In fact, considered probably the most important achievement of medical history in the 20th century. If we consider it, especially on the world stage. So what happened? Okay, we saved lives. When I say we collectively, I mean pharmaceutical firms, working with activists, act up, etc. Lives were saved and they still are saved. But what happened? What happened to those people now older adults with HIV? Where did something went wrong in delivering health care and changing health behavior? Uh, we have to think about that. We have to think about the fact that we're not just treating the person because of an immune infection. We're treating these people in total at any given moment, not just because of HIV, not just for viral suppression. Viral suppression becomes the obsession well, the drumbeat of the HIV management of care in the epidemic. And yet it is, it's, it's so loud, it, it kind of makes everything else not being heard right now. Um, so, uh, so, if you look at this data, this data actually shows that people with HIV who are older adults, this is all over age 50, and this is actually collapsed across all five sites for ROA. We find that uh, if, they're, if they go to the physician three or more times per year, uh, it's for HIV. These are the numbers, 70 and 68% over here, respectively. Uh, actually, I believe this is East Coast and West Coast. But if you look at non-HIV, these are very high rates, you know, three or more times now for non-HIV illnesses. This is a very, again, a shifting share that we have to keep in our mind. And therefore, what I'd like to talk about before I talk about this next slide is that we know that multimorbidity management is the domain of the geriatrician or the family medicine. We don't have enough geriatricians to treat everyone with HIV as they age. There simply is not enough workforce there. That can be changed if the government changes funding stream uh, to encourage more people to enter geriatrics. But that's not happening. It's just like there is a decrease in oncologists in this country, serious decrease. And yet cancer is a common ailment as one ages. We need to adjust the workforce. We need to change how care is delivered 
and if it need not be only by MDs, but other clinical staff who are more than capable of, of, of managing care. If you look at just San Francisco here for a moment, and this is data in front of us, if you look at what the need was, help needed for socialization, for uh, help with entitlement access, visiting nurses, some of the call visits, take uh, them to a doctor. This is the dark blue bar, right? These are the needs. And the purple bar is the the addressing those needs. What percent of those needs were addressed? And you can see that in every single case, the need is addressed, not completely, not 100%, but the need is addressed. Home repairs, housekeeping, uh, excuse me, uh, finding a job, whatever, the needs are considerable. This is from San Francisco. And if we look at the data, I'm not sure, if we look at the data that comes from Oakland, which is economically more deprived area as compared to San Francisco, of course, we see the exact opposite. We watch the blue bars go in the bottom and the purple bars go up. We find that 40% of the population has an unmet need. I think it's really important to look at our populations and make a determination by asking them what they need and are we fulfilling their needs. Uh, one of the, I, I forget what the title is of this talk today, but one of my, my uh, pet peeves is ASOs. ASOs and HLA is a good example of this, are stepping up to the bat and taking care of older adults with HIV. We're also trying to find our way. I know we're doing this at GMHC as well and other large ASOs. Smaller ASOs are in, in a different position. How does one retool all the service programs that, run, that are so familiar to all of us within ASOs for the older adult? If you walk into any ASO in this country, I'd be willing to bet you that you will not see images of older adults. You may see some, but you won't see that many ages. And unless we create friendly user environments for the older adult, we are not going to be able to reach them. Uh, this is a, a, is a serious problem, and I don't think anyone has a clear answer for it. One of them, is, one of them that emerges from the data from Roa is that people expect ASOs to begin to hold hands with those agencies that know a lot about aging. So we often think about senior centers as the best example, but I suggest that you look at ACL, the Agency for Community Living of HHS, used to be the AOA, Area, on, area Agency on Aging. If you look at the programs that come from the government that are funded by ACL, you will be shocked at the number of supportive services, social services, that are available via this funding stream. Uh, the triple A's are another example. Um, money goes to the Department of Aging, let's say in California or New York, and then money funnels down to local programs. I think the ASOs have to get into that, that, that uh, source of uh, support, uh, which will become even more critical as time moves on because we have no idea economically what we're gonna be like after say the, the, the upcoming election, what our Congress and not only in the USA, but also in locally is going to do what kind of funding will be available. I suspect very easily funding will be reduced significantly. And that reduction in, in funding is going to cause everyone to rethink about how they spend those dollars. They become more and more precious. It's not that we're wasting. I can look at how much we have to work to justify dollars within the, the work of we all do in ASO. And uh, I wonder if a, if a billionaire had to do it, they ever succeed. But we have to think about more efficient ways of accessing care or providing care to this population. And in that context, I have to tell you that at GMHC, and I know this at other ASOs, the COVID infection pandemic has shown us that people, because of Zoom and other such platforms, people, we are serving more people now than we were back in, say, in December that we are serving more for the programs that exist at GMHC, and I can speak to them, uh, not others, that we have more people enrolled in our Zoom trainings, our Zoom webinars, our Zoom uh, 800 line, than we have had before. I think that tells us something. That we thought, because we had always delivered services to younger folks, that, oh, we're going to do something and they're going to come. They're going to come to the, the agency or they're going to come to a... Uh, an auditorium or a dance hall or wherever to, to access the service. 
Well, you know what? We're wrong. Because a lot of people don't want to do that, particularly people in rural areas, but even within cities where there is better transportation. I can't speak for LA about that one, but I do know in New York, San Francisco, uh, and Chicago, where there is good uh, rapid transit, uh, there are increased numbers of older adults going to these Zoom training, which is a good thing. How we sustain that and improve it, I don't have an answer for that one, but I know that people are responding better, or maybe they find that environment of the Zoom uh, uh, in exchange more powerful or more comfortable. I don't know the answer, but we need to look at that. It's also more economic, absolutely. Uh, you know, my I'm speaking from New York right now, and it's about a quarter to three, uh, and it's earlier in California. And by the way, on my my thoughts and heart goes out to all Californians having lived through devastating fires this past year, past a few months. Uh, my dad was a fireman, and I know what happens when uh, they come home from battling often horrific, horrific uh, uh, fires, be they in the forest or in buildings. Uh, it's a very tough time. Uh, and please stay safe and uh, uh, avoid that smoke when you can. Uh, nonetheless, uh, we are, well, things have changed. The whole environment has changed. And it will change even more as we progress over the next few months. Example. We know that there are injectables that are being approved by the FDA and more in the pipeline. These are uh, uh, HIV antiretrovirals that can be injected either once every 30 days or once every 60 days, and some even once every six months. Injectables are going to be game changers. They're going to cause viral suppression to increase to levels that are above 95%. In fact, in New York City right now, our older adult population on average that's a 95% suppression of viral load. And that's without injectable. So I suspect that people who are not inherent, people who can't be inherent will be changed, that those, uh, those numbers will shift toward higher levels of suppression, which is significant. Uh, and because of that, we'll also have more older adults living than they should be, because they will be living longer. Um, Integration and incarceration rates are on the, uh, that are fairly high in Oakland and San Francisco. You can see here 15 versus 22%. And uh, the number who had been incarcerated was 27% uh, in Oakland and 20% in San Francisco. When I first began work on the older bill, I asked that same question, have you ever been incarcerated? It meant you, know, you could have been arrested briefly or overnight, or maybe you were in a penitentiary or whatever for uh, many months. Uh, the number in New York was actually uh, over 40%. And I remember having that number and some, oh, it can't be true, it can't be true. Well, it is. And again, this speaks to the, uh, perhaps the overzealousness of our, of our, uh, uh, um, of our uh, law, system of laws or people being targeted who shouldn't be, we all know that occurs. But uh, being incarcerated affects your life. Uh, and this is not typical in the larger population. I, mean, I always bristle at people who say, oh, person with HIV was all the same. They, they go through the same, th no, they, they've been through different life changes and different life paths that we need to consider every single time we engage them. One of the uh, uh, sidebars, if you will, of the role of research has been the number of focus groups we have conducted. One if not two, three, four, in each city that I mentioned. So that means we've done about 25 in the last few years. And uh, I just came to another series of 20 in New York City. This is a common statement. And it again causes me to think about how is it that we could have given people life, but at this cost, at the cost of loneliness, social isolation, and feeling abandoned. How could we have missed that? I'm not sure, I don't have an answer to it, I'm not blaming anyone, but I ask myself, how could we have missed the fact that we caused this population to have life but at a very high price, uh, given the, their uh, uh, quality of life status? It needs to be addressed, not just because of HIV, but across the population. We need to stop ageism in its tracks. I think it's a worse uh, stigma than uh, HIV. The most common clinical complaint in the ROA sample is pain. And uh, this was kind of perplexing, but when we went back and started some in-depth interviewing, we found out that 
people with HIV report a lot of peripheral neuropathy still, and yet they've relegated the issue of pain to a tertiary level, even though it's there. They've been living it so long, they often don't think about it very often, yet its incidence is very high. And uh, I think it's worth noting, to, we knew this way back when in the beginning of the epidemic, and when certain antiretrovirals could be related to particularly peripheral neuropathy, but you know, it still persists to this day. It impacts health. Anyone who has chronic pain knows how it, it impacts your day-to-day -day living and it needs to be readdressed. Uh, and I know pain management is a, is a challenge, particularly because of the abuse of opiates, but there are other methods. There are other ways of going about it. Food insecurity and hunger. Uh, I'll only give the example of GMHC. We have a large feeding program at GMHC where we fed about 350 people a day in lunch and another 600 at dinner on Friday nights. And we had a pantry that gave out hundreds of boxes every single day. Because of uh, the need to maintain social distancing, those programs are now not there. We do deliver, which is a challenge in New York City. We have a number of, of volunteers who, uh, who drive and allow us to deliver bags to people who request them. Uh, these numbers are very, very high. I'm not going to quote them here, but the need for food is real. And people, I think it's about 14% in the row of sample go to bed every night hungry. It is intolerable. And we see it now exaggerated because of the COVID epidemic. We've got to address this. I, 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 uh, the state of California is an amazing state, particularly because it produces most of the food that we eat in this country. And I've been up to Sacramento and those areas were just amazing. Uh, but I, I'm not sure why this great breadbasket of a, a country, which includes California, uh, is not capable of feeding its population. Something is wrong. So, in general, across the row, 2,500 people, we find that these are risk factors that stand out. 44% have two or more drinks per day. It's one too many. Work out of Yale and using the veterans cohort show that one drink may even be too much, but we're not going to quibble over that. Today, 28% smoke. Historically, almost 55% of the older adult population used to smoke. We have high rates of PTSD. It's nice to know that. We don't have many clinicians who can manage PTSD, and sometimes it's best just to avoid it. 50% have depression, 85% have a poor diet, and 80% do not exercise. In studies where they put uh, uh, monitors on a person's body to see how much activity they have, walking, sitting, going to the store, or it is shocking, shocking how sedentary this population is. If you were 65 years old and you did not exercise, you had a poor diet, and you had unmanaged depression, and you smoked, and you put you too would have multi-morbidity, regardless of HIV status. We need to look at other risk factors and give them priority. How we do that is a challenge, I assure you. I'm not gonna give the data here, but uh, we've been working with uh, researchers at USC who just finished an analysis of how, a survey of how COVID impacts older adults with HIV. We're replicating the same survey in New York City. But I want to point out one thing here. Right in the center, it says the majority, 93%, reported feeling more socially isolated than they were before. It's, it's, it's hard to wrap your way, your head around. Here are people who are socially isolated to begin with, and now they're even worse off than social isolation, which really does impact health, affect the health outcomes. We have to look at that. And half, by four from the bottom, missed healthcare appointments and taking medication because of COVID. The impact on this population is going to be significant. We've not seen it yet. And lastly, uh, as I try to wrap up here, uh, this year uh, we lost one of the leaders of the HIV epidemic. You know, the difference between COVID and HIV is historic, seriously historic. And Larry Kramer, who was a great advocate, bomb thrower, if you will, uh, never said no, uh, died this year at age 84. And I mentioned him because he was the founder of GMHC, which is the largest and oldest uh, ASO in the world. And uh, they, GMHC and Larry had their, their fights among themselves, of course. But we need to think about what Larry left us and activists like him. And we have to re-embrace them. 
he founded ACT UP, uh, of course, which is a powerful organization, which is alive and well today. And he reminded us about silence equals death, this truth that was part of the uh, chant of the HIV epidemic in the early years, and nothing about us without us. The last one, nothing about us without us, I'm always reminded by women who are older, who I engage, who are very enthusiastic compared to men. And I know this is a general statement, but they remind me always that unless the person who is living with the virus, who is older and dealing with all the challenges, which we, I mentioned here today, we will not respond properly to their, their needs. They need to be at the table and they as peers need to carry the message out into the community. Uh, I've seen many trainings occur, which are great, terrific content, but you know, if they come from someone who's like a 32-year-old young woman who's wearing a harmony scarf, it's an exaggeration, or a young man, the, the information is not being transferred. You've got to bring more people who are the peers of the population you serve. And another thought for as I uh, come to an end here, I, th I think many of you remember the quote. It was last displayed in Washington, D.C. Uh, about I think, 12, 13, 14, 15 years ago. I wonder how many people would be alive today who are represented by the quilt. Uh, I wonder how many would be with us today if only they had access to the ARV. I think mean, the numbers would be huge. Uh, it's estimated that approximately 100,000 people in the USA died because of HIV, and that's a low estimate. Uh, our lives, as individuals and as society and as larger groups would be remarkably different. Lastly, uh, as was mentioned in my introduction, uh, we were funded at GMHC to establish a national research center on HIV and aging, and we just sponsored our first national webinar, which we were fortunate to have uh, Dr. Fauci and Ron uh, Johnson uh, give the keynote along with others. And this is the most comprehensive information source online undoubtedly. Of most, most of the information on clinical management is derived from the American Academy of HIV Medicine. And I sit on that committee since 2008. And I have physicians who work with me to put the data, put the information needed on the site. It's embedded, it is, it is uh, accessible, understandable. Uh, I encourage you to go there. Uh, you'll also be able to watch the our last webinar, which by the way, uh, registered 2,000 people and had over uh, 1,200 attendees. Uh, it's a national effort. But uh, what's important is that in December of this last year, I did a poll of the older adults having launched a site. So what do you want? What do you want me to change about the site? What do you need? And I heard consistently from about 35 people who I surveyed that we want videos. We don't want to read. We will when we need to. But we want videos. They want to be to get information the way almost all of us get information out there in the general media. It's by watching videos, by seeing them. And uh, I think that uh, there's a lesson there. And I'm gonna use an example. One of the speakers we had uh, who I met at a meeting in Chicago was a, uh, uh, a physical therapist, a researcher from Northeastern, Margaret. And I can't pronounce her last name right now. But she has developed a series of exercises, some of which I meant to to address frailty. And it was very clear that her videos, okay, her demonstration of these uh, effective exercises are reach more people than if they read about it. We've got to show people what they want to do and do it in a way that's, I don't want to say entertaining, but like the mass media. And I think it can be done increasingly uh, because of the different uh, resources that we can all access. So think about that, creating videos, particularly by peers, but not only, uh, that go over little tiny parts of how to manage your health, self-help, how to take your meds for cardiovascular disease, what to do to avoid kidney disease. That message gets delivered far more easily if it is visual, if you see it and hear it, not if you read about it. I think we've all uh, come to that, uh, that place in our mind. Uh, I'm going to... Uh, if you come to the Resource Center, you'll see uh, many publications that we've developed at, uh, in New York, as well as others, as well as uh, I would love to post the slides from this, uh, or the link at least to this conference. Uh, I, I must tell you, I've been to many HIV conferences in the last few years, 
I've been to many over the many years, and they really have gotten much better, particularly as regards to the older adult. And I know the last one I addressed here in LA was just terrific. I went to one in Chicago that was really mind-blowingly superb. So uh, there's encouragement out there, and we need to engage the community, and we need to hold hands across this entire USA, ASOs and CBOs, to make sure that the right services are delivered to this population. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Carter. Um, and let me open my window. Okay. Uh, okay, so we've got great questions that have been coming in. And we did finish just a couple minutes early, so we may have a few additional minutes for people's break, which I think will be useful. I know I have to go to the bathroom and get something to eat, so I'm sure lots of others do as well. I'm actually gonna um, be a little selfish and start with the question that I have. And um, I'm at UCLA. We actually have a research project right now that we have preliminary data that's about to be published of a national survey of which substance use disorder is most likely to be present uh, in people with HIV who have an undetectable, who have a detectable viral load. So in other words, which substance use disorder is most disruptive to the care continuum, is most likely to create someone um, either out of care uh, or having a um, detectable viral load. And we were a little surprised that even nationally, when you look at which has the most negative impact and, is the, and, and for its prevalence, it was methamphetamine was, was number one. And so I think New York State opioids were number one, but nationally it was methamphetamine. And you seem to pause a little bit in your data and make a couple extra comments on, on methamphetamine uh, use disorder in people over 60. And I'll add to that that we have, I know we have people on, on, um, in this webinar from uh, San Bernardino and Riverside County, and we have people from Kern County, and we have these emergency department projects there where we're routinely screening people for HIV. And I've spoken with the emergency room physicians and the first thing they say to me is you would not believe how many people over 60 um, screen positive for methamphetamine and are testing positive for HIV um, and are also using methamphetamine. So if you could just spend just another couple of minutes, why did you pause at methamphetamine? I, I, I pause on that thing because for those people who do prevention research or, or training, I hear the same message you're, you just iterated that uh, methamphetamine has been around for quite a long while. In fact, it fueled the uh, German uh, army in World War II. But um, it's, I think it's you know, any addiction is a function of many factors, but one of which is accessibility. Meth was kind of an expensive drug, even as a party drug back in the 90s, and, uh, early 2005 era. And then it recently became very cheap, I'm told, especially on the West Coast. Uh, by the time it gets to New York, the prices I think are hiked up. I'm not sure, but I, nonetheless, in general, it's cheaper. So cheaper makes it accessible. I think that explains part of it. Also, anyone who's aging, in 73, God knows, aging is not one of those fun trips of life. And anything that might give you a little kick in the butt to get moving or be more active is somehow encouraged or, uh, or embraced by the older adults. So I think there's a reason why. But I also think from our mental health interviews that people are using methamphetamine to maybe self-treat depression unmanaged, as well as to use it as a catalyst to engage younger people. It may be. I think it's it's pure speculation, but I, I, it's a serious issue. How it impacts your health is fairly well known, but not in the older adult. So uh, there's research to be done, and uh, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a catalyst, once again, for uh, not just HIV infection in this case, but more so for uh, poor health behavior choices. Next question is going to come from Brian. Yes, thank you, Dr. Karpiak. Um, I have a question uh, that um, uh, relates to a presentation that you did for us last year, but you were talking about um, what can HIV providers do um, um, to basically, um, you know, ameliorate or, or um, help some of the um, um, 
conditions that you laid out of loneliness and depression and uh, um, substance use and on and on. Um, I, I, first of all, mental health uh, uh, issues are best addressed by mental health, you know, experienced people, not by the primary care physician, even though he or she might want to do that. It's not advisable. They need to get into the hands of good mental health practitioners. Uh, and as my, what I see in the data is that it's largely those services are not readily available. Some people do not need, you know, verbal therapy or pharmaceutical intervention or whatever. It could be just a group therapy or whatever. There are many ways to manage the depression and they should all be considered. But uh, I think it's accessibility uh, that, and mental health providers are, have to be uh, sensitive to the needs of Latinx, African-American, gay, whatever populations that are heavily impacted by HIV. We need the primary care physicians to make referrals out to the mental health provider and to follow through on that. You know, most antidepressants that are used today need to be titrated. You know, they give you a dose and then they come back in a few weeks and then the doctor asks, well, how are you doing? And, and they adjust those up and down. That doesn't occur. That really doesn't occur with the primary care physician. That physician doesn't have that kind of time. So maybe part of the answer is you're, yes, accessing good mental health professionals, but also a care coordinator. Somebody has to coordinate mental health, clinical care, social issues within that one person. And uh, that doesn't exist except in a major teaching hospital. Okay, great. I, I see, um, going back to substance use, uh, and I see a comment from Jeff Taylor that we have a huge math problem among older MSMs here in Palm Springs, and many use it to treat social and sexual anxiety. But we have a question um, that came into the Q&A box. Um, I'm gathering from a clinician. It says, in my anecdotal experience, substance use recidivism in later life also appears associated with self-management of chronic pain. Given your discussion of substance use and comments about pain, do you have any data that supports this? Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that comment. I don't. And in all the data that I collected and see, no one's actually looked at that relationship. And it could well be. Absolutely. So uh, we, should, we should take a look. But no, I haven't seen it. But it makes I, sense. I, mm -hmm. I, know, uh, I know that in our California listening sessions, and we have a panel on that coming up, uh, that um, a lot of people talked about trying to manage their chronic pain. Um, and it was a challenge. Yeah, and it, I mean, it is absolutely. And you know, if you ask the question about methamphetamine in a, in a non HIV population or population who isn't at high risk for HIV, they, you know, they'll almost say, well, What's that? And they don't even know that such a stimulant exists out there, uh, which is in a way surprising, but not really. You think about it. So, uh, you know, it makes sense. Not good sense, but it makes sense. So, Dr. Karpiak, this question is about the HIV care cascade. Um, how, how do you expand the notion of the HIV care cascade to be more inclusive of conditions for older persons? It, seemed that, it seems the cascade limits our understanding and view um, it, to HIV only, and uh, do you think this is causing harm? I, I think what COVID's doing, it, but also the aging population is it's kind of shaking the cage and saying, you know, we've got to look at this population through a different prism. And we look at prevention of HIV through the prism, the prism of sex prevention, prevention of unsafe sex. We have that, done that for years. And that has kind of colored, if you will, or tainted sexual health in the process. Uh, I think we need to do the same at every level. We need to look at the person holistically, not just through that HIV lens. We've got to kind of put that aside. It's there, we shouldn't ignore it, but we've got to look at other factors that affect the lives and the health choices of this population. We've got to change how we look at the whole person, not just their viral suppression. I think we've been, we've been talking about this uh, already, but if you could just comment, someone asked, how do comorbidities and aging in people living with HIV relate to um, uh, life expectancy? And the data shows that the number of comorbid conditions really uh, the, the level of disease burden affects health outcomes, not unsurprisingly. Uh, and if we include in that poor mental health management, 
not good nutrition, not uh, good access to, to uh, exercise, all those things cumulatively uh, operate together. But I think that from a clinical viewpoint, the more clinical conditions you have, needless to say, the more challenges you have taking medication or for other therapeutic intervention, it becomes very hard to manage, especially if a person is socially isolated, living alone, 70% live alone, they don't have a person in their apartment or homes and not nag them to pick up your shoes, move your rug, you'll fall down. Uh, they're devoid of that, uh, which we had shown a long time ago. So I think that we've got to somehow, uh, as a community, come together and begin to address all, not just HIV, all of these conditions uh, to, do, to do otherwise is a failure. Brian, do you have a question or I think you're next? Okay, um, I do. We have a couple more questions. Um, have you seen the aging process and HIV play out in the health of persons uh, living with HIV? Um, can you elaborate any more on that? I think the, you know, none of us are ready to age, regardless of HIV. We are. We confront aging when the plane falls out of the sky. Something goes wrong in our health. And it's the same thing is true for the older adult. So it's kind of like a shock. You know, all of a sudden, you've got cardiovascular disease, you've got acute cancers, kidney disorder, they go on and on. Natural degeneration, uh, your skin is sagging, whatever, the signs of aging. But aging is not a disease. We've got to teach people that. We just have to get them ready for things that are going to happen. Things change. And uh, we're very ill-prepared, not just in nature, but uh, in, our, in the society in general. We are, we don't like aging. I don't think anyone really likes it, but I think it's part of the natural process of living. And we need to change that attitude. Uh, maybe the HIV world has an opportunity to do that. I'm not sure. But I think that we need to be ready. And you know, we train people about how to take their meds and, and things to do to improve their health in the context of HIV. But we never talk about What's going to happen as you age? What is going to occur? It doesn't occur to everyone, but it'll occur to many. And if it doesn't occur to you, you're going to have friends around you or family members that it's going to happen to. And how are you going to help them? So I think we need to educate more and more about aging. Uh, Europeans are, have a much healthier attitude for aging, uh, and as they do in other parts of the world. Asian countries, have, they embrace aging in a more positive way. We are uh, the exact opposite in this country. We run the other direction, regardless of each of these guys. So I'm going to ask you, someone who has thought, uh, obviously, deeply and have a lot of knowledge around um, HIV and aging, we're, if we were to do this, uh, this webinar in five years or 10 years, what do you think might be different on the webinar? I think that what will, what, because of injectables coming down the pike, injectable AR ARVs, we'll find uh, viral suppression to be above 95% in general. So I think that that issue will have been taken care of. Whether EHGs succeed or not, I don't know the answer to that one. Uh, but I think that we'll be focusing on not so much heart disease or kidney disease, but we'll be focusing on the social determinants of health outcomes. We all use that phrase, especially researchers. But no one has ever shown me, side by side, the fact that if you take this drug and put it alongside managing your health, your mental health better, that both of them have equal impact in the health outcome, or at least a significant impact in the health outcome. Everyone gives lip service to, oh, we've got to address the social determinants of health. I've heard, we've heard this forever. Well, where is it? Where, why, why aren't we addressing it? And I think it begins with the person and the, and the providers of care, but also providing services that are needed as one ages. You don't need them when you're younger. Uh, I think that we're going to be a much more savvy and knowledgeable population uh, five years from now. Great. Thank you, Dr. Karpiak. Um, do you mind uh, just going over some of the principles of gerontology? I've heard you speak about that before, and I think it would be really valuable for this audience. So I've had been very fortunate to work with several geri geriatricians who also work with HIV at Cornell, Einstein here in California as well, uh, Meredith Green up in San Francisco especially. 
And uh, you learn from geriatricians several approaches to health. One of them is, the primary one is, their goal is to keep people functional. So by keeping people functional, you keep them independent, you keep them out of long-term health care facilities. That's a good thing. People should be able to age in place. So that's one thing that geriatricians are very well, well aware of. The other one is that geriatricians know that to be, have effective health outcomes from their uh, medication or in, uh, uh, interjection of exercise or whatever, however they're managing the health of that person, if the person is part of the health choice plan, are they active participates in their therapy, in their, in their treatment, that their outcomes will be far, far superior. Very often, we all do it. We go to the doctor, we listen, and then we take the script and go home, get it filled by the pharmacist, and that's it. We need to engage our health care at every single level, especially the older adult, and especially the older adult with HIV. They need to be engaged, and if not them, their caregiver. The other is that the need, you have to stop thinking that every single disorder you have has to be treated. Some don't have to be, or some have to be given lower priority. And part of the reason for that is to avoid polypharmacy, to avoid taking so many medications that they begin to uh, interfere with each other or side effects that were not expected appear. Uh, those, are, those are guiding principles. Functionality is the goal, keeping the person independent. Second, making sure that they don't overtake their drugs. The rates of polypharmacy are as high as 37% in this population. I've, I have had many a client, I'm not an MD, I'm PhD, who will show me the meds they're taking, and I'm like shocked. Okay, I had a young, uh, not young, uh, a short little Latinx woman, she was like in early 40s, and she uh, told me after I gave her training that she was taking 26 medications. I said, um, it can't be. Yes, are they all script? Yes. And, and then she told me in the next voice that she was on kidney dialysis. Oh, of course you are. So I, I told her to go to the clinic. I knew where she went. So I said, stand in the middle of the waiting room and yell, scream, and holler that you need help. You've got to get rid of the, the number of medications that you're taking are unnecessary. Let, let's say that we are a pill addicted society and we don't think our physician does us any good or really treated us unless we leave the office with script. You've got to change that mindset really very, very important. So I'm going to, we're not going to thank you everybody for all these great questions and we won't be able to get to all of them. I'm going to kind of combine a couple sure. questions. So your uh, ROA study seemed to focus on metropolitan areas, New York, San Francisco, and Oakland. Um, do you have any thoughts or data on, um, on the situation in rural areas? We do. And uh, second part, uh, what can we learn from other countries? So rural areas first in the United States, and what, you know, are, are there any best practices in other countries that we can learn from? Think about that. Second, I've, I, actually, I've not seen many studies that look at rural areas, and then I think about the European continent. Maybe it's not as rural as it, it can be in the USA or Canada. I'm not sure. We did look at upstate New York rural areas. In fact, we constricted the sample to those people who did not live in any metropolitan area. And there clearly were differences. The mental health status was clearly worse. The reliance on transportation was much higher. In fact, by basically, it was transportation that was the greatest barrier to accessing care or social support services. And there was greater social isolation, which you would expect in a rural population. So they have different challenges. I'm not sure what their ultimate health outcomes will be, but uh, they are clearly at risk. And uh, researchers for, who were funded by NIH showed in the last decade that you can do teletherapy over phone to, uh, to people who are in rural areas, uh, effectively done and actually sometimes more efficiently done. So we, we've got to invoke telemedicine, especially for people in rural areas. Great. Brian, maybe I, we can do a, a couple more questions and then announcements before the break. Yes, yeah. Um, uh, I think one more question. I think we've covered uh, most of them here. Um, so this is a, um, a comment and a question from uh, Jules Levin. Um, so we, we have data that pain increases with aging and aging people living with HIV. Um, and um, do you agree that the aging and comorbidities occur 10 to 15 years earlier in people living with HIV? Um, 
I think that the, first of all, the number of comorbid conditions, clearly the frequency is increased. There's no question about that. As I tried to emphasize, I believe a lot of that is related not just to HIV, but to other factors, other risk factors. The thing that we don't know, we don't know, is what's the interrelationship between HIV and any one of these other risk factors for, say, cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, whatever. We don't know that. You know, some people, if you have a disease that occurs in a person with HIV, HIV is present, and there's got to be some consideration of how one modulates the other. We don't have an answer to that. It's a very difficult question. I, I, am, I know there are those who argue about accelerating aging. Uh, that is a hypothesis. It, for me, it hasn't been proven to its, uh, to its logical conclusion of being true. Uh, I always tell people, I know people who study aging, forget about HIV, but will travel the face of the earth to talk to someone who's lived beyond the age of 100. If people with HIV are experiencing accelerated aging, researchers would be beating a path to the door. They're not. I think part of the reason that we think that accelerated aging occurs is because we don't have a good grip on age. You know, your age is tied to your date of birth. Well, this is the worst measure of where you are in aging. Okay? And a lot of the data which, uh, which uh, is being mentioned here is really bound to your date of birth. Makes sense. But we know, everyone knows, that if you age, a person who is 70 years old can be very different from a person who is 60, can be very different from a person who is 70. I always tell people, play a little game. We all lie about our age. We all come up a few years. You get to my age, even a few years doesn't make any difference. Try increasing your age. Someone say, oh, how old are you? Instead of saying you're 43, say you're 53. Instead of saying 53, you're 63. Really lie and say you're 93. Watch what happens. Watch how the person looks at you differently, perceives you differently, including yourself. So I think that what is aging and how is it manifested in the body is so poorly known. The tying it to accelerated aging or aging five, ten years or later is really not possible. Okay, thank you, Dr. Karpiak. And I, we just have a couple announcements. Um, I'll start with don't forget about the Tuesday, uh, the Tuesday sessions from your counties. And so to email Brian Risley. Um, and also we have uh, for the the, the five uh, and the HIV epidemic counties, we're gonna have our first learning collaborative meeting Wednesday the 30th from 10 to 1130. If you're from an EHE county and you wanna participate in that, uh, Elena Rosenberg Carlson, if you could just put in the chat your email and people can reach out to you. Um, and it looks like we're gonna have a couple more minutes for the break. Do you have any other comments, Brian? No, I just wanna thank Dr. Karpiak for an excellent um, presentation and uh, um, and invite everybody back in in uh, about ten in about twelve minutes actually. So we have a great panel at twelve thirty. Um, Tom needs to use the bathroom as do I. Uh, grab some lunch. Come back. Uh, we will be here, and we look forward to uh, to seeing you again. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Carpenter. Thank you. Thank you all. So welcome back, everybody. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our first conference panel um, that will discuss our California HIV listening sessions, APLA Health, um, in collaboration with numerous community partners in both Southern and Northern California, launched a series of a total of 16 listening sessions for people uh, over 50 living with HIV. Uh, we did this from the fall of 2019 to the summer of 2020. Um, Emerald Esme Germain Snow, one of the facilitators of the session, um, will give us a deeper background and introduce our panelists as the moderator. And so um, I welcome Esme. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Great. Hi. Thank you for the introduction, Brian. It's so nice to be here. Um, this is an issue that's so near and dear to my heart. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and jump right in with some of the main findings from the um, listening session. And can everybody see my screen okay? Yes. Okay, great. 
So uh, these listening sessions were actually something that came out of a planning group that APLA uh, facilitated in the fall of 2019. So uh, some participants recommended that we do some listening sessions all over the uh, state with folks living with HIV over the age of 50. So that's what we did. Um, we created a semi-structured discussion guide, uh, which focused on uh, people's experiences living with HIV over time, uh, their socioeconomic concerns, um, you know, their daily living and their social capital, as well as their medical needs. So there was a total of 16 groups. Um, each was about an hour and a half long, some a little bit longer. And uh, we did them between December of 2019 and June of 2020 in both Northern and Southern California in areas with uh, high numbers of folks living with HIV over the age of 50. Um, here is a little bit of data from the uh, for, from 14 of the 16 groups. Um, so seven of the sessions were conducted in Spanish. The other seven were in English. There was a total of 149 participants. Again, um, there's two more and that, that data have yet to be added. Um, the mean age was 57. We had about 80% men, about 20% women. And we also had one uh, participant who identified as gender non-binary and also one uh, woman who identified as transgender. Um, nearly, all, uh, nearly all of the participants made an annual income of less than 35K a year, and roughly about 70% of them were stably housed. Uh, the demographic breakdown, uh, put simply, was um, a bit over half uh, Latino, Latina, Latine, Latine. Um, 24, about a quarter white, and 9% uh, Black. And uh, the participants were diagnosed between 1982 and 2018. So I'm going to go ahead and just give you a really uh, brief overview of some of the main findings. So these are some of the main findings from the Spanish language groups. Um, so, you know, not surprisingly, documentation status was a, a big topic that was brought up a lot, um, and it was brought up in, in, in many different settings um, and, it, and mentioned as a barrier to many things, um, but namely qualifying for services um, and programs. So that was a big topic. Um, another really big topic was a need for services in Spanish, and this was for medical, but also um, social services. Basically, um, anytime there was a lack in anything, um, Spanish speaking participants mentioned like, oh, and even more in Spanish, you know, there already isn't enough mental health, but in Spanish, you know, forget about it. There's not nearly enough. Um, they also mentioned the importance of having uh, providers who uh, both speak Spanish or I, and or identify as uh, Latina, Latino, Latine um, for linguistic and cultural relatability. Um, part of it was the language component, you know, being able to freely and feel comfortable speaking um, the language that you feel comfortable speaking, but then also that cultural part of, you know, we heard things like, well, they know things about my culture, you know, um, I'm from Central America, there's a lot of different uh, countries within Central America and different kinds of cultures and, you know, um, I want a provider who has a basic understanding of that. Um, they also mentioned the importance of community and support specifically um, in, in the Latino community. And they, um, there were many different reasons why this was mentioned, you know, sometimes as kind of a need, um, but also as um, just kind of mentioned, you know, spontaneously and specifically in regard to sharing your status, um, sharing your, your status with people around you. This was brought up a lot that like family is very important, community is very important, and that being a big topic. Um, they also mentioned this idea of um, that we've all probably heard a lot is like knowing the system. Um, and this, this happened, um, this came up a lot in all of the groups, but especially in the Spanish speaking group that you know, you really got to figure out how the system works to know what kinds of services are being offered um, where and when, and also like how a lot of that happens through word of mouth and through, you know, support groups, people sharing information, people sharing resources. All right, so now on to some things um, across groups. So, um, and I'm going to focus on economic uh, topics and housing because those were the things that came up the most. So, um, 
A lot of participants described being in precarious financial positions um, and, and express difficulty in making ends meet. A lot of times they describe like the various ways in which they pull together different sources of income and social support to uh, make ends meet. Um, some of them also talked about this idea of, you know, making too much money to qualify for things that they need and being in that very difficult um, position of, you know, not making enough money to do what they um, to cover their expenses, but then not then making too much to qualify for help. Um, they also mentioned that even if they had insurance, there was difficulty in covering uh, health expenses. So these were things that either insurance um, couldn't or wouldn't cover or just um, health insurance like under underinsured and issues with um, high co-pays and things like that. Um, they talked about employment and lack of employment um, opportunities. So, and, and this um, intersects with a lot of their diverse identities as well. Um, they mentioned age, they mentioned uh, limited physical mobility, sometimes uh, their HIV status as being um, a barrier in accessing employment. Um, and a lot of them mentioned that they would love to have more training opportunities, um, especially in like computers and technology, um, and, as, and also, you know, have those kinds of trainings in Spanish as well. Um, housing was a huge concern for all groups. Um, that's why it's the only thing bolded. It's something that came up every single group that, that I moderated. Um, and especially in the Bay Area, it was, it was, it was a severe, um, a severe need um, affordable housing and stable housing. Um, and then the needs of transgender women emerged in two sessions uh, with specific mentions to um, services, but then also challenges in employment um, and opportunities for, um, for that uh, population. And then lastly, um, you know, current events. So they did bring up the fact that uh, socialization, social isolation measures for COVID and then also the uprisings associated with uh, the killing of George Floyd and the, Black, the BLM movement more broadly um, have impacted their mental health and stress. So I know that was a really quick overview, um, but um, I wanna make plenty of time to engage with the panelists. Um, so on the panel, we have uh, Jerry Turner with Possibilities, and we also have uh, Jeff Taylor with HARP. Um, we have Raul Robles with the HIV Planning Group, and uh, Lisa Valtierra, which I'm not um, sure of their organizational affiliation. So I, I don't have one. <laughs> oh, okay. No Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so I'm going to go back to um, my slides real quick and just share with you all. Um, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I missed one slide. <laughs> um, so I'm going to really quickly talk about some of the health concerns brought up by these groups. Um, so I'm sorry to make y'all rewind for a minute. Um, we have uh, the, the um, main things that came around, um, around health were, uh, had a lot to do with the intersection of HIV and other issues. So um, one thing that came up a lot was um, feeling happy and positive about the medication improvements over time, but of course the um, concerns around cumulative effects of taking these medications for a long time, namely like on internal um, organ health and, um, and other um, aspects of their health. They also talked um, about, you know, the intersection of aging with HIV. I feel like a lot of participants mentioned, you know, I'm not sure if it's, you know, this is something that just kind of happens with aging or if this is something, you know, to do with HIV or both. Um, they also talked about the quality of their HIV treatment and care. And this was mostly, um, the concerns were mostly around personnel. So, and this wasn't for um, all participants, but many of them brought up the lack of HIV uh, specialists in their HIV care and uh, wanting, wa wanting people who are more um, highly trained in HIV and also um, providers that they could establish kind of like a long lasting connection with. Um, also comorbid health conditions, very common. So uh, issues with bone health, uh, chronic pain, diabetes, cholesterol, hypertension. Um, for women, bone health issues were mentioned um, more frequently. Um, and they mentioned they were exacerbated by HIV medications. 
Um, and then this one was a very big one um, for mental health. A lot of participants brought up this idea of not only wanting more mental health in their communities and it to be more advertised and more out there, but they also mentioned like more options for mental health. Like they felt that they um, were being over prescribed medication. And, you know, the moment they came in with a mental health concern, it was like, here's medication. Um, so they expressed a lot of interest in like alternative modalities alternative healing and mental health mo modalities and more like talk therapy and strategies for mental health. All right, so with that said, yes, that's the end of um, the main findings for the listening sessions. Um, so we have our panelists now, and these are the questions that um, I wanted to ask for the panelists. And um, the first one is, did anything from these findings jump out to you? Um, maybe something did, maybe nothing did, um, but I'd love for you to share on that um, if you found anything surprising. And uh, so I'd love to hear from like two to three panelists on that. Um, and then from your perspective, what did we most gain from conducting these listening sessions? Um, you know, did we learn anything that, you know, maybe we didn't have a lot of um, knowledge about? Um, and then same thing, I would love to hear from the other two or three panelists. And then the last question, moving forward after seeing what, the, what these participants have, ex, have expressed um, as their needs and priorities, what do you think must be done urgently to improve the health and well-being of uh, this population of folks living with HIV who are over the age of 50? And for that one, I'd love to hear from all of the panelists. So um, I'll go ahead and keep this slide up so folks can reference it. Um, but yeah, so for the first question, um, did any of these findings uh, jump out to you? I'd love to start with uh, Raul, if you're willing to start. You know, it comes to, uh, to me the lack of providers, uh, uh, especially in Spanish. And when it comes to uh, sexual health, it's less likely to communicate with the provider, especially if we need an interpreter. So it'll be another person in the mix. So that's one of the reasons we're not able to communicate about our sexual behavior with the doctor, especially if we, not our, uh, if we are uh, monolingual. This is Jeff and I'll jump in if I may. You know, we're talking about language and uh, cultural sensitivity and one group that is always left out of this discussion are the deaf and hard of hearing. And people really, you know, assume that because materials are available in writing, there's closed captioning, that this is enough and it's not. Um, just like with, um, you know, Spanish speakers, um, English is not their first language. It's, it's ASL, American Sign Language, or in some cases, um, Spanish Sign Language or other countries. Uh, they all have different languages for their sign language as well, which is not well appreciated, I think. And I've been working with this community for years, and it's just really frustrating that the funding is never there. Uh, there is lip service paid to the ADA, so it is a legal requirement. But when it comes to actually providing um, translation and appointments, mental health especially is a huge unmet need, because how do you do that you really need a therapist who is uh, themselves uh, deaf or at least fluent in sign language to be able to provide that care competently. So I think we need to keep that uh, for, you know, first and foremost in everything we do. And it's not hard to, and not all that expensive, to put together videos of translations in ASL. You can do a little picture in picture, that sort of thing, but it's, it's really desperately needed because this community is woefully underlooked, underserved, and, you know, they're suffering as a result because they don't get the information and um, they're suffering because of that. This is Lisa, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, thank you for that. Yeah, go ahead, Lisa, thank you. I was just gonna say that I don't, nothing really jumped out at me, but what I think was most revealing is that the same social determinants of health that have been around forever are just being more exacerbated, especially in this era of COVID and George Floyd and all of that social upheaval. And, you know, I think the HIV community has been one of the most um, effective communities since way back when in dealing with social determinants of health because all the agencies really addressed, you know, did their best to address those issues but clearly so much more needs to be done. And I think that's where this friction and, and needs still exist because as a society, 
we haven't quite gotten there. So then that leads us, you know, what do we do with the resources that we have? And I think the mental health care is still one of the most important aspects that is never fully um, resourced. Thank you for that, Lisa. And our last panelist, since we um, have the time, um, love, would love to hear from you as well. Jerry Turner. Anything um, come up uh, surprising for you about any of these results? All right, um, we'll go ahead and move forward. Um, so, and the, the second question is pretty similar to the first question, but what do you feel like we, um, we gain from doing these listening sessions? There I go, now I am muted. Could you repeat that question, please? I couldn't quite hear it. Oh, of course. And I'm sorry, I actually don't have, I, I don't know where I can access the, oh, there, I can access the chat, I think. Um, or no, I can't while I'm sharing my screen. So I apologize if someone was sharing anything with me in the chat. Um, yeah, Jerry, so I'd love to hear if any of these findings uh, jumped out at, at you. Did you find any of these to be surprising or shocking? Or are all these pretty um, intuitive with the work that you've been doing? Well, they're pretty, they're pretty intuitive, uh, but I, the one that really strikes me are, are the mental health issues because they certainly exist. Uh, and I see that all the time in terms of people isolating. Uh, when, I, what, what bothers me about, so much about isolation is we don't always know who these people are. Uh, so trying to get in touch with them and uh, uh, is difficult uh, at best uh, when we can uh, get them to show up at an event or for a forum. Uh, it's difficult to get them back again. Uh, there's a, lack, a real lack of uh, psychologists and psychiatrists in San Diego. Uh, so that was, you know, that one really struck me as an, an extremely important one. Yeah, what did you all think about this uh, theme about, you know, more mental health being pretty uniform across all groups and specifically like this feeling, um, again, not all participants said this, but many of them felt that they were kind of being over prescribed medication, you know, um, psychotropic medication. Uh, does this feel like something, does anyone have any comment on that? I, I found that as the moderator, I found that very interesting that they were um, vocalizing a, a need for diverse mental health like strategies and and care. Yeah. In, in San Diego, in our uh, uh, group, <laughs> I think uh, people were just looking for care. There's, the care is just not there, and no matter what. It's just not available. Um, yeah, this is Jeff, and I'll jump in and you know, the problem we're seeing is that um, we're fortunate in Palm Springs are pretty well resourced, although it is really hard, um, you know, if you're medically indigent, all the services are provided, but if you're in between, even if you have good health insurance, accessing your mental health, especially talk therapy, because you're right, too many people just prescribe a pill and think that's it. People's problems cannot be solved with a pill. Long-term survivors have a lot of PTSD from having lived through the epidemic for 40 years, all this is being triggered again with deja vu all over again with this most recent pandemic with the hostile administration, bungled public health efforts and so forth. And again, very little information about people living with HIV. So what we've been trying to do, and I think is needed across the board, is to really create mental health um, services that are tailored to um, older people living with HIV and they're unique, especially addressing the, um, the past trauma and PTSD because that really gets ignored. And that's the, the crux of most people's problems. And we hear it from clinical providers all the time is they can handle all their, their clinical health issues, you know, their HIV and their aging comorbidities 
But the mental health stuff is what sends people down the tubes. They just give up on life or don't have the coping mechanisms. So we really need to do um, services that are specifically tailored to this population. I would agree with you, uh, Jeff, and good to see you too. Um, and also for women, I mean, it's really hard to access a mental health care provider who understands women and HIV. And, you know, that gets um, kind of deprioritized. And I get it because not, you know, of where the epidemic is, but still it's really important. And, and then you look at if you're working, if you're fortunate enough to have work, do I even have time during the workday to go see a therapist? No, I don't. So shifting the, what resources we have to more compatible hours with people who are trying to make their lives, you know, keep them complete is I think another challenge. And yeah, it's just, it's really hard for, especially when you get look at cultural issues in terms of accessing mental health care, you know, for Latinos and for a lot of blacks, going to a mental health care professional is a huge stigma. And finding that comfortable zone where you can talk to somebody who understands your culture, that's a really big barrier. Uh, I'm sorry, can I jump in here? Uh, actually, yes, actually, uh, when it comes to mental health, it's very hard to get uh, access to a psychiatrist here in San Diego because they're not bilingual to psychiatrists. Uh, psychiatrist. I think it's one or two in the whole uh, San Diego. And so the waiting list to get into a psychiatrist, it can go for months and months. Mm -hmm. And there's another problem with that too here. And that, that is uh, the psychiatric help or psych psychological help that's available is usually short term. So what do you do with that if someone needs more than short term uh, of service? You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, I just saw a comment talking about remote services. And I think that's a great idea because you know most people do have a phone um, and it doesn't have to be a smartphone you can still talk to somebody so making that more available especially now that I'm sure with COVID that a lot of things have gone virtual and remote but that would certainly make it more appealing and it also may help with some of that do I really want to talk to somebody face to face if that's somebody's issue um, so that slight bit of distancing might make it easier. But that could also help with the hours issue. But then the other problem is how do we make, let people know that these services are available? You know, like I wouldn't know that any services are truly available without having to do a whole lot of homework that I don't have time to do. So it's a lot of those logistical things that I think need to be addressed, but yet can be with technology. So. Yeah, and another right important issue that was raised in the, uh, the chat from Jules Levin mm -hmm. is the reliance on pills also creates more comorbidities. If people are over-medicated with antidepressants, they're more likely to fall, have sleep issues and things like that. Um, for men, especially um, erectile dysfunction, which can itself be depression, you know, depress depression inducing. So we really need to think about, you know, how much we prescribe to people and if that's a good thing or not. And same with women. We don't want to be sexually dysfunctional either. So I agree with you. Yeah, thank you everyone for your comments. Um, at, in the Q&A session, if you want to um, further explain uh, Jules Levin, I, I think there will be the opportunity to do that. But um, I just wanna make it clear that I'm reporting findings from these listening sessions. So I'm not presenting um, my view, although I do have my view on that. Um, this is directly from the participants themselves saying that they, they really wish that there were more um, you know, resources for alternative modalities for mental health, whether it be, you know, workshops on, you know, coping strategies or strategies for dealing with stress and anxiety, um, meditation, um, alternative healing modalities, and then also talk therapy. So that, that was definitely a salient topic. Um, so I'm going to, um, we're doing great on time and thank you. I'm all, all four panelists. I'm really glad that you all have had, um, such great comments and concise comments about these, uh, questions. So let's move into some solutions, you know, based on what we're seeing as these big, um, topics coming out, these big themes, we got housing, um, services in Spanish. Also, um, Jeff, I loved your comment about the ASL. We see that a lot. Um, I, I see that in a lot of the spaces I um, operate in as well, that there's a big need for that. 
um, and uh, some of these health concerns. Uh, what do you all see as some of these like things that must be urgently done to improve the health and well-being for, for this population? What do you all see as being some maybe even low hanging fruit and then maybe like some higher hanging fruit that will be a little bit more long term? Yeah, I, I think we need some more services that are directly uh, that are directed to people who are aging with HIV. I can't think of many in San Diego. Uh, John Kiesler, who's on here, runs a uh, an HIV an, uh, an aging and HIV discussion group once a month. Uh, as far as I know, that's about it. Uh, so there are there's there's a bet the discussion part. Uh, Social groups have disappeared across the country. I think there's some some opportunities there uh, that that can happen. Um, but, but I see nothing coming from agencies uh, that is directed toward people who are aging with HIV specifically. Uh, I, we just did a real run through of all the organizations in San Diego and what they offer, <laughs> so it's just a big project. And that is not there, it, is, it does not exist. Thank you for that, Jerry. I wanted to uh, throw in one more thing um, about these listening sessions. Because a lot of these participants were recruited through existing uh, social programs, that's something for us to keep in mind in terms of these findings too. These are people who are already plugged in, they're aware of the system, they're aware of how it works, and you know, they go um, to groups and um, I didn't mention this in the slides, but, you know, social support groups were such a source of help uh, for folks and, you know, how they find out about um, services and resources and just a big, big um, source of support. And um, they all stress the importance of them and would like to have more of them. They talked about them disappearing over time, different ones disappearing. Mm -hmm. Like that. The one thing I would like to mention before we run out of time is that we urge pharmaceutical companies to really start looking at long term side effects because, you know, this bone health issue is not imagined for women. I mean, it's, you know, osteoporosis is very dangerous and it's happening at younger ages. So, with the long term use of all these different meds, they have to have the data, but of course, nobody's pushing them to really do these phase four trials. So I think that would be something that from that medical perspective would be super helpful because asking questions, they're like, well, we haven't seen anything in the data. Well, it's out there. You just haven't looked for it. Yeah. And this is Jeff, and if I may, I, I think we, this is a rallying cry for activism. Once again, you know, a lot of people aging with HIV were on the front line. So they come to Palm Springs and they say, I'm retired, I don't want to do it anymore, but we need to if we don't do that. So getting on your Ryan White Planning Council, um, getting on the uh, committees for the ending the HIV epidemic, because that's where the money is, especially Ryan White. So we need to be making noise at those levels and getting the, everyone to the table because people who are monolingual Spanish, deaf, you know, other women are all underrepresented people of color in general. And we need to get them there to make sure that um, because th there, there are funds and we need more and that's the way to get them. Uh, and about that, Jeff, I think we also need you just to be more out about aging with HIV. Uh, it's, I know it's difficult for some people to, to make that jump and, and be open and honest about it uh, on their Facebook page or among their friends or whatever it is. Uh, my feeling is uh, if, we, if we're not out and loud about this, we will be forgotten uh, because we know how that works. If you're not visible, you're forgotten. So I think we need to make every effort to be as visible as we possibly can within agencies and just out in the world in general. Yeah. I think we need to push to, see, to go see the doctor instead of uh, just doing a follow-up uh, visit just on the phone. Because uh, uh, this, this time right now with the COVID, the COVID uh, we just have just a following a visit just on the phone. And as an HIV uh, long term survivor, we need to come and see the doctor because they can find things we're not able to see in our bodies or uh, infections or something we're not able to, to see or they're not able to see just on the phone. 
Raul, what do you see as being an effective um, kind of messaging for that, for encouraging folks to visit the doctor more? Or do you think it's a more structural issue of making that recommendation? Uh, yes, I think, yeah. <clears throat> I think that uh, it comes with, uh, uh, by, being, by being connected with services, especially support groups, uh, we, we share a lot of the information by going to the support groups and if we don't, if we don't go to support groups, we completely, we, we uh, reschedule appointments, we try to stay away from services. Uh, one of the things, uh, when they were talking about uh, drug addiction, uh, the use of, the, uh, the use of drugs, uh, I have a neighbor right here and uh, he increased his use of methamphetamine just by, just by being in the house and not able to see a doctor. And I go, so you don't go and see your doctor? No, I just, I just make my phone call just to, <laughs> to go, uh, so I don't need to go and see him. And, I, and he can still do more and more, more drugs. So uh, yes, I think the, uh, the availability of support groups is very important in a county, especially here in San Diego and South San Diego. Yeah, and again, I think women, or have been lost in this in this uh, whole uh, evolution, I should say, because this is all new. I mean, we're the first generation of people living this long with HIV. So, you know, with any luck, nobody else will, you know, they'll find a cure soon. But aside from that, this is all new territory. And so we don't even have a guide. There is no guide for this. There's no 10 steps to better living with HIV as you hit the 50 and older mark. And yet, we all have such wisdom in how we've been able to manage this far that maybe we could kind of put out a little primer and saying, here's the things you need to look out for. Here's the things you need to make sure you talk to your doctor with and let's check your mental health and make, you know, and kind of like a checklist of, are you dealing with this and that? And even disclosure issues are still an issue because the public doesn't know about you equals you. You know, you have to tell people about that. And so it's all of those things that are combined that are making aging, I think, even more. I mean, aging, getting old is hard enough. You know, you add HIV on top of it and things pop up that you're thinking, wow, I didn't think that would happen. You know, so it's, it's a kind of a brave new world for all of us. And that's, I think, where we're having the biggest uh, challenges. Yeah, Lisa, thank you for that. Um, I, I love that you said that, you know, aging is a hard process enough and then you add HIV. And then also when we add all these other um, layers of intersectionality and, and marginalized voices and both both marginalized and, and privileges that different people have um, when aging uh, while living with HIV. So I appreciate that a lot. Um, this It is uncharted territory in a way. Um, so we're gonna have plenty of time for questions and I'm, I'm happy for that. I think to just wrap it up, I'd love to know on the same lines of solutions, I, I wanna know wh what, what has, have you seen really work to really improve, whether it be the health, mental health, social um, situation of this population that you all work with? This is Jeff and I'll jump in with that. Um, this Thanks, came Jeff. up uh, several years ago in San Diego and um, our local Let's Kick Ass AIDS Survivor Syndrome uh, group, which is a social group for older people with HIV, long-term survivors, went to the LGBT center here in town that has a very robust mental health system and uh, program rather, and said, you know, we don't have anything that speaks directly to our needs. So we worked with their uh, program managers to create a closed support group for older people living with HIV, conducted by an intern who was himself a survivor of the epidemic. And um, they found it a incredibly successful. They've been doing it ever since. The director has since moved to DAP. She now does it there. And um, everybody signs up for it, loves it. And it's, it's been a huge help. So we need more um, services directed by the people who need them. So that's why we need their voice at the table to make sure that happens. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, I, I think we also need to look at aging and HIV, not as one thing. We often hear people 50 and over. Well, <laughs> some things that are happening to people at 50 aren't happening to other people until they're 70. And I tend to look at, I would, I would love to see a, a scale that goes uh, 
the childhood of, of older age and the pre-adolescence of older age and the adolescence of older age and so on. So we have a better idea of, of what's happening with individuals along the way, because we're certainly not all in the same spot. Right. Yeah. So Jerry, can I just ask you a quick follow-up question? Would that be like something that folks like yourselves develop together or would that be something that you're requesting from some outside um, entity or? Well, Certainly, I think both are, uh, are included, but we need to look at the research first and see what's there uh, and, and see if when we we're talking about uh, comorbidities with aging, when do they start, when, when do they get worse, uh, what's the timeline on that, on that kind of stuff. Uh, so if we start there, then we have some idea what to do. Uh, I think very often what happens with research is it stays as a research finding. Uh, and the next step is, of course, what do you do with this finding? And that, those steps aren't always taken. I don't, I don't think that's the researcher's job to do that either. Uh, you know, but the next steps that need to be taken often are not. You know, there are exceptions, of course. Yeah, but. Well, one of the huge deficits in the research that Jerry's referring to is that they're looking they're not selective and making sure that we look at older, older people, people 65, 70, 80s, and 90s. You know, the vast majority of people, quote unquote, aging with HIV are now in their 50s and 60s. The overall numbers of, you know, comorbidities and problems is fairly low in this group. So the researchers look at it and compare it to negatives and say, well, it's a problem, but not a huge problem. Well, nobody's looking at what happens. How can you study aging without looking at the truly aged? So we know what's going to happen to people 10 and 20 years down the road. So that's a huge um, gap in the research that we need to be advocating to, to have changed. And the other, to your point, Jeff, the other part is looking at our baselines and charting that because we, we, you know, we've been going to the doctor since forever. So there's a lot of data on each of us as individuals, but also collectively. So we should be start being able to see those trends and when that aging is actually beginning. Like for women, you know, menopause is hitting sometimes five years earlier. What does that do to her overall health, that loss of hormones, what's going on there? And I haven't seen any data about that at all. So it's those kinds of things that would be nice to know so that you as an in, individuals can start thinking, okay, this isn't out of the norm and yet it's still normal within my context, but we need that context. Raul, would you like to share um, with us what you think about um, getting back to the, the earlier question that I posed was, what, what do you see that's working in your communities? What do, what do you see as really, um, what are some solutions that you've kind of tried out to implement and that have worked, that have, have done something positive? Oh, Raul, you're muted. Like I, like I said, it's uh, uh, to be in support groups uh, also, uh, uh, get together. I mean, we get together, friends out of the out of the support groups. There's also help. Uh, what is help in in my case is like to be open on Facebook or social media, and a lot of the a lot of people I can direct them to go to social services, uh, to go to a doctor. Where can they go to a doctor? Or a trans a transgender woman can uh, request me like. You know what? Where can where can I get this service? Because uh, nobody knows in the with my friends and also you know what? Call this person or go here or go there. And uh, is uh, for me it's, uh, it's working very good to be on social media because I'm able to reach out to a lot of people in the community. Um, I'm going to jump in real quick. I haven't seen much to be honest working for women. I think so many services that we had in the '90s and early 2000s have gone. And so I think a lot of us are just kind of checked out and we keep in touch with our own friends. And that's obviously very, very helpful because your circle of friends who knows all about you, they're always a willing ear to listen to what's going on. But other than that, from a system perspective, I don't think much has been really successful to tell you the truth. Thank you for sharing that, Lisa. Yeah. Um, I, I have a, a related but kind of unrelated question. Um, since we do have a little bit more time, I wanted to know, is there a space where 
folks who uh, work in, in service pr provision um, or, or are in the world of, um, of this world in, in, in HIV care and, and social services, is there a place statewide where you all are connected and can share resources and, um, yeah, resources, documents, um, things like Facebook groups, like you just linked, like there, is there a place where statewide folks are connected? Oh, yes, there's, there's many HIV support groups on, on, on Facebook. And I mean, most of the people, well, some of the people in the, in the panel, I mean, I know them from, uh, from, uh, from the long-term survivors groups. And uh, there's plenty of information we can get, you know, from there and take it to people who don't join those groups. And it's very weak. Uh, uh, we can get the uh, information instantly, like, on the news, just uh, something about the long-term survivors, we can, we can disseminate the information with our communities, you know, in, in minutes, if it's not in a, in a day or two. What about anything off of social media? Like, is there any, like, yeah, I don't know, forum, email listserv, statewide, you know, California, HIV providers and, and community members, anything like that? I don't know of anything. I do, I, I do know that we have 28 organizations in San Diego County, ASOs, uh, and they're all separate. There's no single unifying organization. Susan. I think at one time there used to be a, a lunch where people could gather and, you know, uh, organization heads could gather and share information, but that doesn't exist anymore. Um, unless they're just not inviting me. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, and San Diego County is a pretty big county, <clears throat> um, so we, we, I think we need that citywide and countywide. A lot, much of the county doesn't have HIV services. They're all along the coast or on the border. <laughs> They're not inland at all. So uh, there's you know opportunity there. I think to somehow pull people together to discuss one problem or another or a situation or uh, an issue. Yeah, but it's not happening. Yeah, I mean, to, to answer your question, or Esmeralda, I, th I think we need something regional. And I'm wondering if this group um, might be a place to start that sort of thing and create those kind of online connections and maybe have conferences and things like that so people can compare best practices and that sort of thing, because you're right, it's desperately needed and does not exist. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, even just, um, and I, I apologize that I'm, I'm definitely going off, off script at this point, but I, I think I'm just kind of going with the flow, even looking in this chat, just seeing how many resources are being shared and resources that are being requested and people, you know, sharing different um, things with each other. I think um, I, I, it just piqued my curiosity. So um, glad, glad to hear that. Mm -hmm. um, any final comments before we go into the Q&A? Any final comments on the findings from the listening sessions or if you had any um, final comment that you'd like to share with us about solutions and priorities for this? Well, I think the lesson, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the listening session here in San Diego uh, with the long-term survivors in Spanish, I think uh, you saw all the people, I mean, it was the, the whole community was there. There was the heterosexual man, heterosexual woman, transgender woman, uh, non-binary. I mean, it was very, very, uh, uh, I mean, all kinds of people you found over there. And I think it was, uh, I was amazed to see the response and the, uh, how much they loved that session in San Diego. And I think uh, thanks to, to Terry, Jer Terry uh, Jerry Turner for uh, uh, outreach to me. <laughs> That's great, Raul, yeah, love to hear that. Any other final comments? Yeah. Waiting for the questions. All right. Well, it was so nice to um, to engage with you all. I know I had met three of you and engaged with three of you. It's so nice to see you again. And Lisa, very nice to meet you. And thanks for, for engaging and connecting on this. Of course. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everybody. We do have a lot of questions that have come in. And hi, Lisa. It's so great to I see you. I know. I know. It's good to see you, too. It's I was just, yeah, I finally get to publicly thank you for your years and years and years of service and support to our programs here. So wow. I really, You're most welcome. I just got the chills. 
So um, I'm going to start by asking, Raul, you really sparked my interest, and then a question came through. You mentioned that uh, a friend or a colleague or a neighbor had increased meth use that uh, was kind of masked because of telehealth. But I just want to hear from all of you, since we're in the middle of this all together, going through this experience of COVID, what's it like accessing services remotely? And what things might you continue to maybe do? Like if you like telehealth, if you have had any telemental health, if you've had any uh, tele services that you've, you know, accessed. So anybody want to start with, you know, how has telehealth been for you? I, I like telehealth. Unfortunately, uh, when it comes to uh, mental health, it's not happening. Uh, when it comes to, uh, I, I will support to be with my doctor uh, mental, uh, on te tele, uh, tele sessions or, or tele uh, appointment with the doctor. Because especially uh, uh, as a Latino man, we are kind of um, shy when it comes to uh, infections or to look into geni genitalia. So uh, it's be it's very, I found it's very easy for us because uh, if I go to the doctor and if it doesn't hurt, I wouldn't tell the doctor about, about it. So when it comes to, uh, uh, if I see the doctor on, on the phone or having the appointment on the phone, it's very easy for me to say, you know what doctor, I have this problem here. And the doc doctor can easily say, oh, show me, show me on the phone. And it's uh, very easy. Very easy to do it. Uh, more, more are likely to go back to the doctor after the doctors check on us and if they found, you know, if he found something very, uh, we need to see it. Yeah, Anybody else? Can I... Go ahead. Yes. I, I was going to say that we've had an issue here in Palm Springs with at least one provider where the um, the doctors were encouraged not to do telehealth because they don't get reimbursed as much for a telehealth appointment as they do for an in-person visit. And this was in the height of COVID and we had at least one doctor uh, quit as a result of that. So that's the challenge. And I would imagine that with coding and that it's so universal and this is not gonna go away anytime soon that we need to continue with telehealth. It needs to be a way that uh, you know, um, institutions and clinics don't take a hit financially because this is what they need to provide to keep people healthy. And that's actually changing. Um, a lot of legislation is up at the federal level to change that coding so that people do get reimbursed. So I think now that telehealth is actually here to stay, especially in this era of COVID, I think legislators have realized that they have to start changing those laws to allow for, for this exact kind of delivery because people are being left out left and right. And also the pharma industry happens to be behind telehealth um, and changing those regulations at all. So there's some actual po uh, policy synergies there. Anyone else on telehealth? Back to your, yeah, I was say back to your question, Tom. Um, it's worked because I'm fortunate to be able to go see the doctor and then if there's any follow-ups that don't require an actual visit, you know, talking about test results or whatever, those are easily done over telehealth and I think it's a godsend. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like some people may like to continue it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, there's a comment in the chat about a population that rarely gets thought of, and those are homeless people. Uh, the comment uh, is about telehealth and telemedicine. You know, if you're living on the streets, you may not have a phone, you may not have access to uh, a computer. Uh, so I think it's one of the populations that we just don't know a lot okay. about and probably and it would be great to somehow uh, get more information about that. I'm not sure how that works, uh, but, uh, but it certainly is a need. And Brian, Brian, if you don't mind if I ask sort of a follow-up because it's with the sure. comment that came in. So I see that Rebecca um, Huffman has made the comment that telehealth and telemental health has been a major barrier to care for all the clients I've worked with during COVID. People experiencing homelessness cannot always keep their phone, for example. People who have cognitive or mental health struggles cannot always utilize the technology. I've seen so many people fall out of care and decline drastically because of the changes in the way they get help. And so I'm going to use that to a segue that a question that came through uh, from another person that says, I provide social services for people living with HIV. My client population is more weathered and destitute compared with today's panelists. Can any of the panelists identify specific things that have enabled them to age so successfully with HIV 
and maybe reflect on colleagues or friends or clients that didn't have those things, whether they were internal or external, and so faced more struggles. It's, um, thank you. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I absolutely, completely understand my privilege. I've been extremely fortunate throughout my life that even with my diagnosis, sucky as it was and is, I've had the right people at the right time in my life to make sure that I got to this point. So, you know, having come from mostly dead to now, in fact, I was just talking about this yesterday with a friend that, you know, I said, oh, I'm going to be on this panel on HIV and AIDS. She's like, aging? What are you talking about? Which, you know, made me laugh. And I'm like, it is kind of funny, but I never thought I would see 50. So what's helped is, A, living in Los Angeles, no doubt, because all the resources are here. And having an amazing social network, including family. So, and, and being fortunate enough not to have other comorbidities, either mental or physical. That, you know, and again, that's luck of the draw. There's, um, you know, again, I get how fortunate I am and I am grateful every day. But the mental health piece, honestly, finding even just one person that you can talk to who understands is so life-saving. And early on, especially, that was probably the piece that has saved me most and has allowed me to thrive. Yeah, this is Jeff. And I think when we talk about this, we need to realize that as people get older, we're going to see more and more cognitive issues. There's a lot of, kind of subclinical problems that people are compensating for. But as they get older, at some point, they stop compensating. And, and you know, they have trouble with memory and remembering things to be able to function and do everyday tasks. And you know, given how many people with HIV have been on disability for so long, they are one step away from homelessness. They miss an appointment and don't renew their benefits. They're out in the street, they don't have meds, that sort of thing. Right. So we need to, really need to have an aggressive case management system, buddy programs and so forth, to keep people engaged, to recognize when people start having these problems. You know, typically it's so subtle and it happens over time that the individuals themselves don't know. And if they're lucky enough to have a partner, their partner will say, hey, he or she is not. Yeah to be in there forgetting stuff yeah. but we really need to be thinking about this proactively because otherwise we're going to have people a lot more people who were doing fine before falling through the cracks mm -hmm. especially with the loneliness now and isolation people living on their own i mean at the beginning of this if i fell and hit my head no one would know for days because i lived by myself you know so things like that but even just being alone especially again march april may is like okay i need to check myself like am i getting too lonely and this is going to be a problem. So yeah, I absolutely agree with you, Jeff. That is a huge issue and it's going to be popping up as we go through this transition of isolation. Well, and further compounding the problem is that um, given the incredible increase in, in cost of living, especially housing in big cities like LA and San Francisco, people are experiencing forced economic relocation. So they lose those networks altogether. Yeah. We see this all the time in Palm Springs. We have a fairly cohesive community, but people move down here and they don't know whom, how to access that. And, you know, they're floundering. This is happening all over. People move to small towns or back with family where yeah. they don't have the network of the services. So we need to be thinking about that on a statewide level. Yeah, especially right now, people uh, postponing uh, doctor's appointment, uh, postponing uh, going to the specialist because uh, this is going to over very soon. This is going to over very soon. The vaccine is coming and they stop going to the, uh, they postpone their, their appointments. And unfortunately we're going to be, we're going to go to the doctor when, when an infection has come out or something pop out, like we have to go to an emergency or. Great. Thank you. Brian, you have another question? Yeah, this is, uh, this is from Kevin Sitter. Um, Dr. Sidir, were any of the participants in the listening uh, sessions living in public housing, especially um, housing for elderly? And if so, uh, was there friction because they're living with HIV within um, these settings? And similarly, if people are using traditional services for seniors, 
are those services competent at um, attending to HIV? That's, that's a compound question. So maybe we'll talk, uh, address the first one um, of people, anyone from the listening groups living in public housing, um, especially ho housing for elderly. Um, Emerald, you did a bunch of sessions. Um, I did a bunch of sessions. So um, I'm, I'll let you address that. Yeah, I'll, I'll be honest with you all. Um, I, I that didn't come up specifically um, in, in the sessions that I moderated. That you know, someone identified themselves as as living in public or or Section Eight housing. So uh, unfortunately, I don't have much of a comment on that. Sorry, folks. I, I do have a comment on that. I, I don't know that this would be considered public housing, but I live in a complex that's for people who are sixty five and older. Um, and there are how many? One, two, three, four, probably at least four people here who are living with HIV. It's not a problem among the other, uh, uh, among the other residents. Uh, but the problem with the other, res other residents is uh, many of them are holed up in their units and we don't see them. So, uh, the, so I probably, in the, I would say in the last two years, I may have seen 20 people who are living in a complex with 50 units, some would be two occupants, so, and the others don't see them. But among the, among the people I do, uh, being HIV positive is not an issue with them, uh, being gay is not an issue with them. Um, so that's just my experience in, in, in this kind of uh, living situation. Good, Thank, thanks for uh, sharing that, Jerry. Um, what, what I did here was not specific to um, housing for elderly uh, with people with HIV. It was more for people living in um, either uh, halfway housing or uh, emergency housing. Um, or other kind of public assistance housing where there definitely was a lot of tension uh, between people who had HIV and people who did not. Um, and uh, I know a lot of these people came to APLA Health, to our housing uh, program to try to get okay. help, to try to get help with that. So there are a number of questions that relate to um, um, Latinx uh, populations and accessing services when they're stateless or undocumented. Um, and I'll add to that, there was uh, specific questions about, um, you know, people over 50 accessing services uh, uh, around immigration, like pro bono attorneys, et cetera, especially in the Inland Empire, San Bernardino, Riverside. So does anybody have any comments on um, accessing services for undocumented? And that also came up as just, it was hard to find services for Spanish speaking populations. And within that, there's a subset often of undocumented. Or did it come up on the listening sessions? Uh, well, I have a couple of friends and when the restriction, the traveling you know, from Mexico to San Diego, uh, they left, they left San Diego, so they left the services. Uh, I don't know if they're ever gonna come back. I think they still have, uh, uh, they still able to have contact with their, with the providers, but not, uh, they're not able to come back and, and see and seek other services or anything. Anybody else? But yes, when it comes to undocumented, the, the barriers are higher and longer. And, and I was gonna mention that we did do a, a few um, listening sessions that weren't targeted for people over 50 that were undocumented around immigration and HIV oh, two, three years ago. And I was surprised at the number of women over 50 who were showing up to those sessions. And because of the environment in this country, we're talking about being so afraid to even go to the grocery store and having other people with HIV talk to them about like, you can't live like that. You've got to, you know, you've got to um, get out there and you can't, you know, be afraid of just going to the grocery store. 
Brian, you have the next question? I'm going to go back to the question I asked before because it was a compound question. So I'm going to ask part two, um, and that is um, if people are using uh, traditional services for seniors, um, are there are these services competent uh, for people living with HIV? Um, anybody's experience on the panel? Lisa, you're, you're muted. I was saying that I'm still fighting the idea that I'm actually in the senior group. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm fighting it tooth and nail. Um, so I haven't accessed anything specifically for seniors. I've just accessed care that I need, but it's not directed at because I'm over 50. I, I don't think that helps your, your question at all, but I'm in denial. <laughs> Um, uh, San Diego County has a, a, a whole bunch of services for people uh, who are over 50. Uh, most, of them, most of them are directed toward uh, frailty, Alzheimer's, falling, and that sort of thing. So over 50 doesn't always apply to that. I don't, I don't take part in any of those. I mean, I tried Tai Chi once, but it was like, there was hardly any movement. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that's because I, the instructor told me that the people who come to her classes are not ready for much more than just the smallest amount of movement. So I don't, I don't partake of any of this. So the, the, those things are there. Um, yeah. This is Jeff. And one thing we do here um, anecdotally is that when people have to go into nursing homes or some form of assisted living, um, they get thrown in with, you know, kind of the broader population, so to speak. And they're encountering, uh, there are occasions where they encounter um, both LGBT and HIV stigma from not just the residents, but also the staff who may be poorly educated. Um, so I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done to kind of bring that kind of awareness to those kind of facilities where people may end up. And trying to create even better, you know, facilities that are really targeted towards the HIV population. And I realize with funding, you may not, not a lot of set-asides for that, but um, I know DAP is putting together a project where they're going to have housing that's federal dollars for everybody, but they're going to have a focus on um, you know, HIV and, and older people and that. So we need more of those. Yeah, I, I definitely agree, Jeff. Um, I've, you know, in the past, I've actually done education in, in uh, <clears throat> different retirement, nursing, uh, type facilities uh, where they had real problems with people with HIV and then, you know, they wanted to know if they should isolate them, if she, they should protect the rest of the patients from that person. Um, so, and this is, we're going back, you know, I've been hearing this, these issues for, you know, 15 years. So um, I think that that second part of the question we can also address to um, the panel we have on Friday, which is actually a panel on traditional services for seniors. Um, so we'll get their input on that as well. Uh, Tom, do you have another question? I just have one final comment, uh, and that comes from Kevin Sitter. When we were talking about in the document, I think he shared something important, which he said, I want to emphasize that ADAP and PrEP AP are not part of public charge. Any resident of California, regardless of immigration status, may access ADAP and PrEP AP without any legal ability as long as the current policy remains. Thanks for that, Kevin. Great. And thank you all to all the panelists. And uh, we'll now move on unless there's anything else you have, Brian. No, I think that's great. A great panel. Uh, thank you, Esme, for doing such a great job moderating the panel. And uh, nice, nice to see everybody. And I, I second Tom's uh, comment to Lisa. Thank you for all your help and support over the years. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate that. Good seeing everybody. Great seeing you, Lisa, and everybody. Bye. Okay, Brian, you have some closing comments and then I'll share the, the agenda again for Friday. Yeah, uh, Tom, I can't remember. Are you doing any polling at uh, the end of yeah. today? No, okay. We're just gonna take, go ahead and take a look at the, um, the uh, 
agenda for Friday. Great. So yeah, so Friday, uh, which is September 25th, is day two of the conference. Uh, we're gonna start at 9.30 a.m. Um, I'll do a recap of day one. Uh, Tom will do more uh, participant polling. Uh, we have a great session called Aging with HIV, Challenges for a New Aging Population. Uh, we have Dr. Paul Nash from USC uh, addressing psychosocial issues, and we have Dr. Miley Karras um, from uh, UCSD and the Owen Clinic um, talking about senior health and health equity issues. Um, we'll uh, definitely have time for a good Q&A with that. And then we have a break and we go to our traditional uh, senior services overview, uh, which has a great panel of people who provide senior services uh, from uh, direct services to policy uh, to planning. Um, and then um, we will do Q&A and have another break and uh, close with a uh, timely session, uh, HIV, Aging, Loneliness, and COVID-19. Um, and that will close out our two-day conference on Friday at 2 p.m. Pacific time. Um, and then, as we've mentioned several times, Tuesday the 29th, uh, we have three regional sessions uh, to address on-the-ground issues um, around uh, senior services uh, to identify needs and gaps. And I have gotten good response so far, so we'll, we'll continue recruiting people on Friday. But anyone who is interested in participating in the Los Angeles County session or the uh, San Diego Orange County session or the San Bernardino Riverside County session, which includes Palm Springs, please email me directly at b-r-i-s-l-e-y at apla.org and I will send you the registration link and you'll get a Zoom link and we would be happy to have you participate. Great, and so that's uh, the comments on Tuesday. And then I um, just wanted to point out, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, on Friday's session, we're gonna end the day with two mental health providers, one of whom is very knowledgeable about immigration and HIV. And I know that was another issue that came up with the panel was, um, these issues of mental health and loneliness. So it's, I think it's a great way to end the day on Friday. Great, great. Um, what, what I would like to ask of our uh, great behind the scenes people, uh, people you don't see, but uh, Sandra Cuevas and uh, Victoria Myers and, and Mark McGrath, uh, Jeff Bailey, um, all behind the scenes, um, is that we create a slide that has the resources that were listed in the chat, um, just so we could show that on Friday. Of all the existing resources um, uh, for HIV and aging social programs, for resources, uh, um, for you know other assistance, there were some great links, including our own um, APLA.org. Um, link to our Hive program where we offer a lot of services for um, more specifically men uh, living with HIV over 50. Um, and that includes life skills, it includes a lot of uh, fun activities, and it includes um, uh, health education as well as a lot of social connection. We're starting an emotional support group. Uh, all of these services are, are not just LA centric, they're available online to anyone in Southern California. Um. Great, and a final thank you to all of the speakers, the panelists and the sponsors, including Gilead Sciences and Janssen for their generous support for today and Friday. Great, thank you, Tom. I look forward to Friday. Okay, we'll see everybody on Friday. Thanks everybody else, bye-bye.